I understand we're now live streaming. So, um, welcome to the first uh, Health and uh, Scrutiny Committee that's being run online. Um, it's been a, a little break since March when we had our last meeting, uh, and it's good to be back. And we have, I think, uh, <clears throat> 31 people on this meeting at the moment, and I'm going to, as a first step, uh, go through the introduction. Um, but it might be as well that I just check with the um, an apology so that we don't um, try and introduce people that have been uh, substituted. So can we just take apologies first, Steve? So, um, the only thing I was going to say is I've been notified that Ian Doby will be substituting for Suzanne Williams. I don't think Ian has joined the meeting just yet, but certainly that's his intention, so it's just worth being aware of that. Okay. Um, let's, um, let's go through the um, people. So I'm um, Brian Robinson. I'm the chair of the committee, uh, and uh, I'm going to go first to uh, Paul Hodgkinson. Is he on the line? Could you introduce yourself, Paul? I am, yeah, you caught me by surprise. Um, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's uh, County Councillor Paul Hodgkinson, leader of the Lib Dem group, representing Porton and North Leeds. Thank you, Paul. Uh, right, I'm next going to go to Terry Hale. Is he online? Doesn't look like we have Terry yet. I know Terry was having some difficulties joining, so he should be with us shortly. Okay, we'll come back to him. Uh, Stephen Hurst, can you introduce yourself? Good morning. I'm Stephen Hurst, County Councillor, and I represent the temporary division. Thank you. Okay. Um, then uh, is Brian Usa hasn't online yet? No, I can't see Brian Usa hasn't down there. I haven't seen him at all this morning. Uh, Nigel Robbins? Um, County Councillor yes. of um, the Science Tester Beaches, um, also Chair of the Audit and Governance Committee. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, Robert Vines. <laughs> Can't see Robert either online at the moment. Um, and we've got Ian Doby. Is he online yet? Doesn't look like. Okay. Uh, I'll go on to the um, district council representatives on the committee. Uh, so I'll go first to Colette Pilligan. Can you introduce yourself? Morning, um, Colette Finnegan, Gloucester City Council, Aberdell Ward. Thank you. Nice to talk to you. Uh, good morning, Claire. Uh, morning, morning, Pam. Pam. I, have, I, have I omitted your, your name, haven't I? Pam, do you want to come in? No, I, I don't think you've got to the T's yet, have you? No, I, I wasn't doing it in alphabetical order. That oh, was... All right. I, um, good morning, everyone. Nice to see you all. I wish we were in a proper pizza and I ate this. But uh, I'm Pam Tracy. I'm a city councillor and a county councillor for Linden, Moreland and Podsmead, covering okay. West as well. Thank you, Pam. Um, You're welcome. Right, uh, Martin, would you like to introduce yourself? Martin Horwood. Hi, I'm Martin Horwood and I'm uh, one of the Cheltenham Borough Council representatives on this committee. Thank you, Martin. Um, Steve Lydon, would you like to uh, introduce yourself? I, I know Stephen's there, but I haven't can't hear him at the moment. Um, has he, are you muted, Stephen? Right, um, we'll come back to Stephen. I'm here. He, uh, oh, you are there. Well done. Steve. Sorry, mate. I had to nip out to let the dog out. It was howling. And you've been uh, caught. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, no, Stephen. Not me. The dog was howling. Nice <laughs> to see you all. Steve Lydon, uh, council, district councillor for the Stanleys, uh, Strad District Council. There you are. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I'm going to go to Helen Molyneux. I'm sure Helen is here. You're muted, Helen. Right. right. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all looking so well. Uh, Thank I'm you. the representative from the Forest of Dean District Council. Thank you, Helen. Uh, and then we go to Dilith Neal. Hello. Yes, I am uh, representing Cotswold District Council. I live in the North Cotswolds in Stow on the Wold, near Stow on the Wold. Thank you. 
Dillis, and then finally to Jill Smith. Good morning, everybody. My name's Jill Smith. I'm a borough councillor for Dukesbury Borough Council. Thank you. So that's our lineup of um, committee members for this morning. Uh, I'm now going to go to the accountable officers that are attending. Um, so I'll go first to the uh, clinical commissioning group um, and ask Mary Hutton to um, introduce herself. I have seen Mary. Mary, can you introduce yourself? Sorry, um, Mary Hutton, the um, accountable lead for the CCP lead for Gloucestershire. Thank you, Mary. Uh, and then I'll go to uh, Becky Parrish. Good morning, everybody. It's Becky here um, from the Clinical Commissioning Group. Nice to see everybody looking so well. Uh, and uh, is Andy Seymour here? Mm -hmm. okay. Andy gives his apologies today. Okay. Uh, then uh, I'll go to the uh, Hospitals Trust. Uh, so, Deborah Lee, I think you're uh, here. Good morning, Deborah here. Nice to see everybody. Right. And, and, and is uh, Peter Lecheski here? I haven't seen him online yet. Good morning, Peter Lecheski here. Oh, welcome, Peter. Um, Right, um, and then we'll go to the um, the, the Gloucester Health and Care um, Foundation Trust. So, uh, Ingrid Barker, I think I can see you. So, morning, everyone. Well done, nice Ingrid. Uh, and yeah. is, is Angela Potter? Do we have Angela? Yeah, yeah, Angela's here. Good morning. No. Okay. Uh, and I'll just go to um, then to Sarah Scott, who I think is the um, online. Just, just to say, it's Paul Roberts here, uh, Chief Executive of Gloucestershire Health and Care, and I'm online too. And Angela, Angela, Angela is online. She just had problems on meeting, I think. Thank you, Paul, for uh, doing that. Um, right. Uh, so I know Angela's here, but um, silent at the moment. Uh, so I'll go then to um, uh, the. Can cancel officers. We've got um, Sarah Scott, I believe, is here. Good morning, Sarah Scott, Director of Public Health, BCC. And I saw Margaret Wilcox is also here. Yes, good morning. It's Margaret here from sunny Pembrokeshire. Thank you. Um, and I believe, yes, yeah, I see Tim, <coughs> the cabinet member, for uh, is also here. Tim, would you like to introduce yourself? Good morning, Brian. Good morning, everybody. Yes, County Councillor Tim Harmon representing Lansdowne and Park and Cheltenham and County Council Cabinet Member for Public Health and Communities. So I think that uh, quite a laborious process, but uh, when you're online, it's difficult to see everybody that's um, in the virtual room. So it's useful to know who's here. <clears throat> so we have a good representation here of um, <clears throat> 33 people at the moment. Um, so <clears throat> we've done the apologies. Um, the, the, the one or two people that were missing, if they can join in, we will come back to them when they're able to join us. Um, so the next step then really is to go to the minutes of the last meeting. Um, so can you indicate you're all happy with the minutes? Um, or should I say, put, let's turn it around the other way. Does anybody wish to question the minutes at all? No, I can't see any hands up on that. Oh, yes. Uh, Dillis, do you want to come in on that? Yes. Uh, this is slightly nitpicky, but in uh, section 7.1, it says the focus of the report is on enabling activate communities, which should be enabling active communities. So you need to take out a couple of letters there. But otherwise, it's fine. That's just nitpicking. I'm sorry about that. That's fine. That's we'd like to get things correct, so we'll 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 take that on board. Um, right. With that amendment, um, can I take it that everybody is um, happy with? It? If anybody wishes to um, object to the minutes, can they let me know? If they don't, I will take it that we are satisfied. I can't see any hands up, so I'll take that as a satisfaction with the minutes, and we will uh, duly sign them when we're able. Okay. Um, that's a minute covered off. So the next step we come to is the public representation. Um, I'm going to um, come first of all to um, 
Dr. David Willingham, who uh, has three minutes. So I know I've seen you um, are connected online, David. So um, I will give you three minutes um, if you'd like to introduce yourself uh, and your topic, and we'll um, listen to you. So over to you. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, thank you very much. I'm a borough council on Chelsea Borough Council, um, representing St. Peter's Ward. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you very much for this opportunity to address HOSC. I hope that you and the other members have had an opportunity to read the short briefing note that I prepared and um, submitted in support of my request, and that this is actually the right committee for this to be con um, considered. For those watching or those that not had a chance to read it, it relates to the high um, COVID-19 death rate in the Alston and St. Mark's MSOA, which covers the majority of St. Peter's Ward in Cheltenham. Um, I would firstly like to put on record my condolences to everybody who's lost a friend or a loved one from this pandemic. Um, I know their grief will still be very raw. What I have to say is that um, Office of National Statistics data suggests that Alston and St. Mark's had 32 COVID-19 related deaths in the three months up to the end of May this year. This isn't just the highest number of deaths in Gloucestershire, it's the highest number of deaths in the whole southwest region, and it is the fourth highest number of deaths in the whole of England and Wales. Email dialogue with the Director of Public Health of Gloucestershire suggests this may be due to the high number of care homes and care beds. And the communities that I represent and the bereaved families of the deceased and families with relatives in those care homes deserve both answers and reassurance. What I'm asking you to do is just to investigate what factors led to that high death rate in this MSOA. And if they were in care homes, what the causal factors were that led to this tragically high death rate. Um, my concern is to ensure that if there are any common causal factors, that these are identified, understood, and then we can take remedial action um, to prevent a tragic repeat of this high mortality rate if there is a second wave. My focus as a borough councillor is, council is predominantly on the ward I serve and represent, as it suffered the worst impact but I recognise there are other MSOAs in Gloucestershire, Chewksbury, um, and I believe in the Cotswolds that also have quite high rates. And I'm sure you would want to um, serve Gloucestershire by looking at that if there are other places that are statistically um, significant elevated mortality rates. I sincerely hope that you will agree to look into this, as I really think it's in the public interest for this to be understood so that we can deliver improved public health outcomes for the people, um, you know, for the future. No investigation, no inquiry and no scrutiny hearing will bring back those who've been taken from us, nor will it ease the pain and the grief of those who remain. But I wholeheartedly feel, out of respect to the families and friends of the bereaved, that we owe it to them and to the communities that we represent and serve to understand what happened, why it happened, and what we should do differently in the future. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me today. Thank you, David, for uh, uh, raising such a, an important point. Uh, I'm going to go now to uh, Sarah Scott, the Director of Public Health, uh, to give uh, a response to that. So are you there, Sarah? And thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, Councillor Willingham. I think you've raised a really important point, and, and I agree. I mean, you very sad nearly 600 people in Gloucestershire and they're all loved, all parts of families and communities. So I think you raise an interesting point. I think that um, if, if it's okay, I'll answer the question to you. Perhaps there's something around the data and intelligence. Sarah, we're, we're, we're losing you. Yeah. We can't really hear you, Sarah. So maybe it's a good idea. Um, cases and deaths, and, and then um, offer some of the possible explanations for the high portion of deaths in Ulster and St. Mark's Ward. And then hand over to my colleague, um, Margaret Wilcox, the Director of Adult Social. Can I tell you? It's better without the camera, but it's still quite poor, yeah. We can hear you now. 
Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, that's good. Is everybody muted who should be muted? Okay. So I was going to bond. I'm going to respond to Catherine again to understand how COVID moves to our population and then to try and offer some explanations for the high proportion of deaths um, in, in Austin and St Mark's wards. And then hand over to my colleague, Margaret Wilcox, who has led the uh, work that we've done in the county in terms of supporting our care homes. So if that's agreeable, I'll do that now. I hope you can still continue to hear me. So <clears throat> for those less familiar with medium super output areas, they're small geographical areas. Um, we have about 75 in Gloucestershire and they cover on average around 8,500 people. They're about twice the size of district council wards. And it can be challenging to understand why there are so many differences between COVID cases and deaths at that medium super output area. The difference are infection rates or smaller numbers of, um, or small number of, of, of large outbreaks or differences in the age or health of the population in each MS MSOA. Um, and also there can be some factors that make people more vulnerable to severe illness than, than others. So I just wanted to assure that the committee that we continue to monitor a range of information on a daily basis. It's seven days a week and uh, every week. And this includes numbers of confirmed COVID cases, the numbers of, of suspected and, and confirmed cases and outbreaks in care settings. We also look at deaths data from the Care Quality Commission and the Office of National Statistics, um, in, particularly in our care homes and our wider community. So monitoring this, this range of information just gives us a, a better picture to understand how, how outbreaks are occurring, if at all, across Gloucestershire. So for any care home suspected or confirmed, the, the care home will be contacted by Public Health England and PHE will undertake a risk assessment and offer infection prevention control advice in conjunction with our, with our local um, service and notify us on the local system. And we then have a brokerage team that is in daily contact with our care homes. And they schedule follow-ups and support the care home with additional infection control advice if needed. Um, we also have a local outbreak management plan, which we continue to keep under review. And, and the information that we, we gather through our intelligence and, and looking at the data helps us understand how best to respond. Um, I think in terms of one reassuring note, when compared to our geographical neighbours, our deaths from all quarters and COVID-related deaths in care homes are very, very similar to our geographical neighbours and our statistical neighbours. So in terms of the high proportion of deaths due to COVID-19 in Alston and St. Mark's medium super output area. So um, in general, during the first peak, we, we saw um, care, high numbers of care homes with deaths due to COVID-19. And this may be due to vulnerabilities in these populations. So most of these care homes were for older people. So age and existing illness we know is a risk factor for, for developing COVID-19 and also um, very sadly dying from it. Um, there are also another possible explanation could be how um, deaths have been attributed to COVID-19. So when we look at deaths um, due to COVID, it's not only on the death certificate where COVID was listed as the cause, but it could also just be listed as a secondary or, or, or um, a tertiary cause. And it doesn't necessarily that COVID-19 was confirmed in that individual. So we don't, we'll never know to what extent COVID contributed to that individual's death. Now, I'm not underplaying the significance of this, but I think there's some, some things we may never actually know the answer to. Um, previously, we've, we've reported there were nine care homes in this particular media super output area with a total of 264 beds. Um, so based on the, the local death registrations, we know that the, the deaths occurred in two of these care homes. So what we're proposing to do is um, we're working, we're in discussion with Public Health England around how we might better understand what happened, bearing in mind that if we didn't take, if we didn't conduct COVID-19 tests on the individuals, we'll never truly know if they died of COVID. But I think we, we need to understand whether we can do some sort of look back exercise and actually which of the medium super output areas warrant this attention. Um, so that's a piece of work that's ongoing at the moment. I think we have to acknowledge that there, there are lots of variables here that we need to try and understand. And we would need to work with our colleagues in the NHS because of course I haven't got access to NHS records. I don't have access to PHEs and outbreak management records either. So um, there's, there's a limit in terms of what my team can do. But on that note, I think I'll hand over to Margaret. I think it might be quite helpful to understand um, the, the, the extent of the work that was, was undertaken by adult social care to support care homes and, and, and um, the, not only the staff, but the patients within them. Hand over to Margaret. Thank you. Um, 
So from the very beginning, we've been in daily contact with our care homes. Um, we've issued um, guidance as it's as it's been um, published and altered it accordingly um, in conjunction with our public health colleagues. Um, we've been very active with the Gloucestershire Care Providers Association. So they've been having three webinars a week and a number of officers, um, plus um, Mary Hutton from the CCG and others and myself have been involved in those webinars, um, sometimes to give information, sometimes to be questioned about things, um, and sometimes just to give them support. So um, as each of the, for instance, the financial support that's been issued through government, um, we've been able to discuss that with them. So um, every care home has had a 10% uplift during uh, for their contracted prices, um, and every provider the same. So whether they're domiciliary care providers, supported living, um, direct payments. So they've had 10% extra on their funding for April, May, and June thus far. And we've got a cabinet agreement that we can extend that to September in the first instance, and we're reviewing it each month according to what they need. Um, we've also had the infection uh, prevention grant, um, which gave a bed-based fee of just shy of a thousand pounds to every bed in um, in Gloucestershire, whether it was um, funded by the state, self-funders, or indeed even if it was empty. So that's been an allocation that's been issued. Um, uh, and that comes in two tranches. So we gave one amount out last month and the second will follow this month um, when it arrives with us. And 25% of that grant has also been paid out to um, domiciliary care providers to help them. It's it's listed as an infection prevention grant, and if you actually read the terms and conditions of it, it's a workforce grant in reality. It's about making sure that people don't travel between homes, don't go on public transport if possible, um, have an opportunity to have a safe place to get changed, um, work on one part of a home rather than um, moving around those sorts of things to try and reduce the infection uh, potential to spread. Um, and then in, in addition, um, we've had um, our CCG colleagues have had a super trainer um, and a team of 23 volunteers to train every care home in um, PPE, personal protection equipment. And that's been very successful. We, got a, we managed to contact 100% of all care homes and um, a, the biggest percentage of them accepted that training either face to face or um, through Zoom. And we've subsequently um, used the fire service to extend that training to um, domiciliary care providers, supported living, and where people are having personal care, uh, for instance, somebody with learning disabilities that's having consistent care to make sure that they are um, practicing in that, in that way. Um, interestingly, in terms of learning disabilities, um, we are one of the um, lowest areas in the country for um, COVID infections amongst those um, service users who are living in supported accommodation or care homes with learning disabilities, um, which is a good result because that's a group that we were really, really concerned about um, at the beginning of this pandemic. And um, what else can I say? I mean, I, I, it's we have written a paper on the amount of support we've given to people and how we progress that as we, as we learn more about it. And, and it, might, it might be very useful for Sarah and I to, to share that with members of this committee, just to um, endorse the fact that we are on a daily basis involved. Um, we've delivered PPE directly ourselves before the um, local resilience um, forum uh, set up the um, stores that we've got. So there's been no shortage of PPE in the, in the county. Infection control team, Mary, I'm sure would want to talk more about this, have been very active in supporting homes. And we've used mutual aid to help each other. Um, and, and indeed, homes have helped each other. And the care home support team have also been involved in, in giving advice for um, helping people. One of the benefits of doing the PPE training was that we got to see care homes because we'd had a couple of reports of care homes not abiding by the cleanliness factors and that maybe that they were slipping in terms of how they were keeping their homes, possibly due to a lack of staff. Um, and we've been able to help homes if, if that's been the case. 
Um, probably stop there and then take any questions or any particular requests for, for information about any of Thank you, Margaret, and thank you to Sarah for that response. Uh, I don't think we're taking questions at this point because this is a representation. Um, so we've had uh, the representation, the committee have received that, and they will be considering uh, what if they wish to do um, moving forward. And I'm sure that um, it will form part of their thought process as they, as they do that. So thank you for that response. And thank you to uh, David William for bringing it to the committee's attention. I'm now going to um, move back to um, an item that I overlooked as we were coming through the agenda. Um, Yes, sir. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I just, I'm just conscious that Margaret and I took a detailed report to adult social care and community scrutiny last week, and just some clarity as to which scrutiny committee will oversee this. Because at the moment, Margaret and I are potentially working to two scrutiny committees, and um, there's a, there's a potential duplication of effort there when there's also there's a lot of work for scrutiny committees to do. So um, we will be doing some further work with our care homes just to assure colleagues, but it's with which scrutiny committee is best to oversee that. Yeah, thank you. I require to go to adult social care and communities committee. Yes, thank you for that, Sarah. Um, I, would, um, I would say that... Uh, <clears throat> We used to be one one um, scrutiny committee, and we've separated them up to allow them to be discussed. So there will inevitably be areas of overlap, and I think it's you're quite right in saying that we don't wish to be duplicating and absorbing up um, unnecessary amounts of officer and cabinet members' time. Um, what uh, what I would I think is that's a question that we need to take to our work planning with the adult care to make sure that. Um, we do appropriately um, al allocate the task to the right scrutiny committee, or if appropriate, to arrange joint scrutiny committees where uh, we can come together to, to do that. So I think that will, from time to time, be an, an issue. And clearly, uh, as this um, uh, pandemic has, has um, adversely affected um, people that are in care uh, in, in some respects, uh, that would be uh, something we need to take on board. But I, I do think we will be mindful of the fact that we don't wish to have two committees doing the same job uh, and uh, effectively duplicating the work. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, right, if we can just go um, back. Uh, I didn't, uh, in my um, haste to get into the uh, agenda items, uh, actually ask if there are any declarations of interest. So <clears throat> can I ask if anybody has a declaration of interest that they could put their hand up? Um, I've got Martin with his hand up. Maybe it's not for that, but Martin, would you like to come in? Uh, well, I don't know whether I should declare that a member of my family works for Public Health England, but um, that might be relevant to later issues. Um, but okay, actually, I did, have a, I did have a question on, a follow-up question on Councillor Willingham's um, public representation and the answers from officers. So I hope we will get a chance at some point in this meeting, Chair, to to follow up on this. I mean, these are really serious issues that have been raised. Yes. And yeah, that's throwing up that's some fine. important <clears throat> issues. When we get into the, when <clears throat> we get into our, our meeting, I think that's, uh, that's we, we are as we as we bring up these, these items as we want. Um, I think what I'm <clears throat> trying to separate out is the, the relatively short part of the meeting that's been brought in for um, uh, representations is is actually that a representation but you are quite right that it's um that it, it may be issues that the committee want to pick up and raise so i think we can do that um if uh, uh, and i think that would be the right time to do that uh, because it, uh, it, it, it <clears throat> rather than rather than take them now but okay well not really but <laughs> it's, it's your decision chair okay thanks um Right, uh, and I've also noted your uh, declaration of interest. I haven't seen anybody else indicating, so we'll move um, <clears throat> back into our um, uh, next representation, um, where I'm going to ask um, 
Julius Marstrand to, um, from Reach to um, come forward and spend, uh, take, give, have three minutes to um, uh, make your presentation to us. Thank you. Chair, I think actually uh, Dr. Bob Arnold is going to speak on our behalf. So he's under the name of Claire Beach there. So if you can switch to him. That's fine. If uh, if uh, if uh, Dr. Arnold um, or Claire Beach would like to come forward, that's fine. If you can unmute and uh, speak. Thank you. Can, can you unmute? Yeah. I see you waving. Can you hear me now? Yes, you're welcome to... Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. So... Yeah, can you see me now? We can see you and hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Robinson, for, for uh, agreeing to uh, allow me to speak to you this morning. I'm Professor Robert Arnott, um, and I represent um, uh, an organisation called REACH, which some of you, uh, with which some of you will be familiar. We have supplied to you um, a letter in the form of a, a, a long email um, in which we have expressed our concerns, and these concerns relate to your Agenda 5 uh, this morning. These concerns are about patient safety and consent concerns. And I also, not only as a representative of REACH, I speak as a patient, having had a, an operation in Cheltenham General Hospital within the last four weeks. The issue this morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, is service changes in surgery and, again, stressing patient safety and consent concerns. Now, this issue, whole issue of surgery and, um, and, uh, um, and whether, in fact, you should mix patients in the same, in the same building together has actually um, been discussed on a number of, on a number of occasions. Uh, the Royal Colleges, Royal College of, Sur Royal Colleges of Surgeons have expressed their, um, their, their uh, particular stand on this. Um, and have come out against it. And a recent study in the British Medical Journal suggested that 20% of elective surgical patients who contract COVID-19 in hospital die within 30 days. So obviously, in behalf of patients, on behalf of the communities we serve, uh, we have significant concern. If I can sort of stress um, some of these particular concerns, um, um, and apply them locally. Continuation of major elective surgery at Gloucester Royal against national advice where a COVID-free site and ITU is available at uh, Cheltenham General. Um, we're concerned that the, there is an illogical transfer of arterial vascular surgery from Cheltenham to Gloucester. We're concerned that there is a potential mixing of elective and emergency surgical patients on levels two and five in the uh, in the GRH tower block. Um, we're concerned that the removal of emergency theatre at, at, at Cheltenham General necessitating, necessitating uh, transfer of elective CGH surgical patients with complications to uh, cost of oil. All of these point, as we point out, um, create risk factors for um, hospital-acquired COVID-19 infection. What we have done uh, to support our claim is, in fact, we launched a survey um, some short time ago and in which we have received 513 respondents up until yesterday. 90%, 97% of all respondents said it was important to be made aware of COVID risks during surgery, only 28% of patients um, who had had surgery on or on the waiting list have been informed about the risks of surgery during COVID. There is a failure of consent here. Only 29 of respondents said that, um, that the trust had separated elective and emergency facilities satisfactorily. Only 28% of patients currently on waiting lists would have elective surgery during COVID if fully informed. And only 17% of respondents would be prepared to have elective surgery at a hospital which had been de designated as a receiving hospital 
for COVID patients if fully informed. These results of our survey, I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, are quite significant, um, are quite, quite significant and uh, quite damning. Um, we therefore, based on our experience, based on what the Royal Colleges are saying, based on our own experience of our own survey, we would like to propose to your committee that you consider um, thinking about the following as, a, as possible actions. Uh, to uh, Could I just, just interject, uh, Dr. Yeah. Arnold? Um, we, we have actually used up the allotted time. Can I, so can I give me 10 more seconds? To a conclusion. Can I have 10 more seconds? Please? Please bring forward, yes. Okay. We would like to see the transfer of all elective and planned surgery to Cheltenham General. We'd like to see the institution of robust consent policy for all surgical patients during COVID-19, during the pandemic. We'd like to reopen emergency theatres at Cheltenham General, and these actions will, we believe, alleviate pressures at, uh, at uh, Gloucester Royal and optimise patient safety during these difficult times. Thank you very much, Chair, Mr Chairman, for hearing from us. We believe we have an important issue that you ought to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arnold, for, for bringing that to the committee's attention. Uh, I'm going to go now to um, Deborah Lee, uh, Chief Executive of the Hospitals Trust, to uh, give an initial response. Uh, but it is an item that really will be a part of our discussion and our main agenda item later. Uh, Deborah, would you like to come forward? And Thank you, Chair. I'd like to start by uh, acknowledging that we have a shared interest here, which is to deliver and preside over safe services. Uh, absolutely uh, no issue with, with any of the comments made in that regard. Rich's letter does, however, cover a very broad range of issues, many of which extend beyond this morning's business, which is related to emergency general surgery. In fact, most of the, the concerns raised relate to uh, elective and planned care and, and the systems and processes and and uh, as we mentioned, consent around those. So I'm going to um, to limit my main response to the business this morning, but just to note that we will respond fully in writing to the REACH letter and all of the points that, that it raises. And of course, we are due to come back to the September HOSC meeting uh, when the majority of the issues raised in the letter are due for discussion as part of our formal update uh, three months into the temporary changes that were enacted on the 9th of June. I think for me, one of the most important things just to note is that we have a collective responsibility and I believe a collective interest in promoting confidence in our health services. Without a doubt, COVID damaged public confidence in the safety of healthcare. We'll all have seen statistics showing the proportion of patients that stayed away from health services and healthcare facilities during COVID. So at the heart of our temporary changes are an attempt to uh, ensure that services are as safe as possible, that reduce the risk of transmission of the virus between patients and staff and to each other. And also that we promote confidence in our services so that those that need them do come back into our care. Therefore, it's really, really important that any information that reaches the public domain is factually accurate. Uh, and I'm afraid there are a number of assertions in the REACH correspondence that, in our opinion, that we can support with evidence are not accurate. So this is a brief opportunity just to ensure that uh, the messages that leave this meeting uh, are ones that confirm that we believe our services uh, are not only safe, uh, our model is one that's been looked at with interest up and down the country, but perhaps most importantly to note that since we enacted the changes on the 9th of June, we've not had a single episode of in-hospital transmission of COVID between patients or between staff and patients. I'd also like to acknowledge that the changes that we have been discussing and will continue to discuss are changes that have been developed by our clinicians. Um, lots of reference to the hand of managers in some of these developments. Um, they're clinically led. I'm absolutely confident that none of our clinicians would preside over services that they thought to be uh, unsafe. Um, you will all be aware that they are professionally accountable to their own uh, General Medical Council for their actions and their acts. And I'm uh, very confident, as I've said, that nobody would uh, endorse services that they thought were unsafe. Of course, the challenge we have is to do uh, the right thing in terms of risk mitigation for the whole county. Uh, we don't have an opportunity to uh, comment on a single geography or a single service. And um, we would be the first to recognise that in getting what we believe to be 
the right approach for the whole county that minimises the risk of transmission of the virus whilst promoting a, a return to many of our usual services um, is about doing the right thing um, for the whole county, which means on occasions there'll be compromise. That doesn't mean that we believe any service has been left unsafe, um, but it does mean that individual preferences uh, from particular services haven't always been able to be met. But I stress that we're absolutely confident that the model uh, that we enacted is, is safe. So if I just turn to um, briefly then the emergency general surgery changes, which are the ones that we are discussing this morning. I think again, very important to acknowledge that all 13 of our general surgeons endorse and continue to endorse the transfer of the emergency pathway to uh, Gloucestershire Royal. And the paper that you've got before you, I think describes the extent to which that is serving as well. With respect to the specifics about infection, um, this is where uh, much of the confusion in the letter is, is um, settling. Uh, for example, um, blue patients, that was actually a national change in name. They were formerly red patients. They're now known as blue patients nationally. These are patients who are confirmed uh, by swab tests to have COVID. And I can confirm that they are never placed in an area with patients who are awaiting elective surgery. Patients awaiting elective surgery uh, have been asked to isolate along with their family members for 14 days prior to surgery uh, and they're only admitted when they've had uh, a, a negative swab result and are then uh, reflected as green patients. So we do not mix those patients during admission. Similarly, patients are admitted whose COVID st status is uncertain. They are all swabbed on admission and they are held in uh, isolation areas or, or COVID areas until we have a negative swab result. Only at that point are they then placed on a specialty ward next to patients whose known COVID status is negative. So back to my opening point is we've had no transmission of COVID between patients, elective or emergency, or between staff working in these distinct areas since we enacted the changes on the 9th of June. Uh, and then finally, to a point that wasn't covered in the letter, but I'm happy to, to comment on it, which is the, the point of consent. There is a piece of national work going on to look at how uh, the standard approach to consent needs to be amended to take account of the COVID context. And we're also doing our own piece of work. So it's not an issue that's forgotten. Um, I'm sure you'll appreciate that it's absolutely laden with um, legal uh, issues uh, and vulnerabilities. So we want to take great care uh, in that, but in the information we provide to patients on admission, particularly those coming in for elective care, we're very clear uh, about the nature of the model that's on offer. So I'll leave it there um, and uh, happy to take questions in the main business item relating to emergency general surgery. And as I said, we'll be back in September to talk about the broader issues that the letter raises. Thank you, Deborah. Um, that's a Thank you for that response. Uh, as I said, we will um, now move into our main committee items. So I would like to thank um, both uh, David Williams and uh, Dr Arnold for uh, raising these points with us so that we are informed and uh, committee members will take that thought uh, with them as they um, go about their business. So thank you very much. I'm, I'm now going to move um, into the main item of our um, agenda which is um, item five, uh, which is the COVID-19 temporary service change. Um, so uh, I would like to invite someone to come forward and um, present that uh, report. And it's uh, Ellen Moore here uh, of Transformation at the CC. Thank you, Ellen. Yes. Can you hear me okay? Hear you. Yes. Yes? Okay, I will take this item um, that the paper is in three parts so it has an introduction which I will cover I'm then going to hand to my colleague Simon Lancely who will cover the MOU pro forma relating specifically the emergency general surgery change um, it, obviously um, we then have the second MOU pro forma which relates to the minor injuries um, service temporary change um, and for that, I will hand over to Angela Potter, uh, um, Director from Gloucestershire Health and Care, to talk to that item. So effectively, you get three of us, and this paper will be in three parts. So can I just check, do you want the questions um, from committee members 
at the end of each section, or do you wish us to take all three sections and then questions at the end? Or what? well, obviously, um, I, I would feel the members if we pull between the two MOE um, because obviously each of those two is quite distinct and different. So it may be that if Simon and myself, if I give the overview and Simon talks to emergency general surgery and then we pause for questions on that topic and okay. then perhaps move to the minor injuries unit item and have questions on that subsequently, would that work okay, do you think? Yeah, that, that'd be fine. We'll, we'll do that. Okay, great. Um, so uh, members obviously have the paper in front of them and I will just provide a brief overview. Um, so you're obviously aware um, of the history of the pandemic and we have sub effectively subdivided our response into three phases. So we have um, referred to the phase of the initial incident response as phase one. So at that point, we were obviously moving at pace um, to ensure our services were safe and responding to an incident that we didn't exactly know how it was going to pan out and quite how severe that peak would be. So a number of um, very short term, um, quite radical actions were taken over a very short space of time. So we took extensive reprioritization of our services to ensure we could manage COVID-19 patients safely in all our services. We moved a wide range of service delivery to virtual channels. Changes happened in primary care, community services and in our hospital um, trust. And we also had extensive use of our independent sector beds, both in care homes as Margaret has described earlier and support for the care home sector but also in our private hospitals and our private hospital beds were used to support hospital discharge and flow and it really was a sense of the whole system pulling together to deliver that initial incident response. We managed that as an integrated care system um, and we developed a system-wide network of what we called bond cells and we still run those now um, to deliver a cross-system response with us all working together um, across all of our organisations in the NHS and social care. Two of those changes were deemed to be substantial service changes and were both notified to HOSC as emergency service changes under the terms of our Memorandum of Understanding. So the first was the change to the Minor Injuries Unit um, with the Vale, Dilk and Tewkesbury closed from the 22nd of March and emergency general surgery being centralised to Gloucester Royal Hospital on the 1st of April. You were notified, obviously, through the two MOUs, and in line with that MOU agreement, we're now presenting back to you that those temporary emergency changes have been in place for three months to ask for a renewal for a further three months and presenting to you a risk assessment of each of the service changes, which we'll pick up under the pro forma detail. So the important thing to frame in terms of the context of where we are now as we're in what we describe as phase two is that we are moving into a new phase of the incident where COVID is still with us, but obviously things have changed quite substantially in terms of the rate of infection, um, the environment around things like uh, lockdown, and as we know we've had a lot of changes recently to that, um, and we are starting to return to some normality, but as many of us have experienced, it's not a normal that feels like the normal we, we had before. And I've outlined here um, in section three, some of the key things that we're dealing with in terms of our services response. So firstly, um, we've suffered quite an extreme loss of productivity. Um, Deborah just mentioned some of the issues around how we cohort patients when they come into hospital. Um, we swab them before we um, decide where to place them. We have additional space and protective um, equipment in our hospital bays. We also have um, PPE, extensive PPE for all our staff, and it takes time to take off, put on, et cetera, et cetera, and extra cleaning in all of our services. So these additional requirements for cleaning, social distancing measures, extended use of PPE, they reduce the productivity and the services in the way that we operate them. And in every measure, in both our primary community and hospital services, our productivity is diminished. We simply can't put the same numbers of patients through our clinics, our wards, our theatres, 
our GP surgeries, et cetera, that we could before. The next point is that we have ongoing substantial additional support needs for people who found themselves in these new categories of being described as either shielded or vulnerable, and their need to have ongoing support, sometimes additional support where they may have developed additional needs through this period, but for that support to be delivered through virtual means. And a significant proportion of these patients are individuals who live with long-term conditions. And quite often some of that care might have been delivered previously in group settings, um, things like cardiac rehabilitation classes or pulmonary rehabilitation groups. And we obviously can't bring those people together in groups at the moment safely. So we're looking at how we can de deliver that kind of care virtually and also um, referring back to the productivity issues I mentioned that applies in terms of staff working out in the community and visiting people at home. We continue to have increased levels of staff sickness absence as well due to um, both uh, individuals contracting COVID-19, of course, although that's very low at the moment, but also the self-isolation requirements and potentially as we see a greater rollout of the track and trace system, an increased need for that to occur. And then the fourth point is regarding the anticipated increase around um, the peaks that we might see this winter. And of course, the very significant risk that we should see a second peak of COVID-19 and the potential for that peak to coincide with a future seasonal flu peak as well. So we're modelling those scenarios and we must maintain a state of readiness to respond. So effectively, to ensure that we can continue to respond to the incident in the way that we have and continue to do, whilst also stepping up our um, routine services in this context, we have instigated a number of temporary emergency changes that you're, you're aware of. Um, so the phase one changes and the, uh, then a second set, the phase two recovery service changes. And these were notified to you on the 10th of May. And obviously, Chair, these are not the subject of our discussion today. And as Deborah has referred, we'll be coming back to you in September to talk about the next steps for the phase two changes. But I did list them here in the context so that you could see how they fitted together in terms of the phase one changes that we're asking for the renewal of today. And then the phase two changes that we talked to you about more recently. So the key points I would draw your attention to, as outlined um, at the end of section three, is that we have delivered a fully joined up response to COVID-19 with that initial incident response that I described as phase one and our recovery plans as phase two. I would stress again that recovery at this stage does not mean all services can return to normal and we have a significant range of challenges affecting our productivity but we have successfully increased the level of planned cancer and community and primary care um, being delivered across our system. We need to do this while maintaining a state of readiness for a possible second wave of COVID-19 and are modelling the potential for, a potential for this second wave to combine with winter pressures and with seasonal flu. And to support both phases, a number of service changes have been put in place and we've notified you using the emergency change approach. So moving on to section four, you will be well aware, um, and it's been picked up as well in some of the other communications, of some of the overlap between the emergency changes and our well-developed Fit for the Future programme, which has been running for some time now and is due to be brought to public consultation later in the year. We do fully appreciate there is a considerable complexity regarding the management of this message and with our other stakeholders that this overlap could create. And we know we need to put really clear communication around this. But they are different. And we have um, got a plan in place to reinstate the timeline around our Fit for the Future programme. And I know um, you've obviously asked for that timeline from us and we'll be updating on that a little bit later in the meeting. So the key points for this section is that the Fit for the Future proposal is different and remains our mechanism for agreeing permanent service change. Our Fit for the Future proposals are modelled based on 
normal in inverted commas, um, whatever that is now potentially, but our normal demand um, rather than our COVID-19 demand. So it is focused on the medium to long term and not on the short term response to a crisis, which is what these temporary emergency changes are concerned with. So moving on, um, in terms of the next steps, um, this paper obviously requests um, for two emergency service changes to be renewed, and we ask for your support for these today as a committee. We have provided some detail in the paper and are happy to update on the timeline for the Fit for the Future programme, and um, we've also provided some further detail on the incident response and how that sits in our wider strategic context. In September, we propose to come back to you and to bring a review of the emergency service changes and our proposals for any further renewals of, of these in light of our preparations for winter. At this point in time, we've not completed that winter planning exercise. And so our proposals um, for September will reflect the completion of that work. In September, we also plan to bring the Fit for the Future pre-consultation business case with our intention to move to consultation on these proposals and the longer term proposals in the autumn. This will be subject to the successful completion of the usual assurance and governance that is associated with any longer term service change. And finally, so I would reflect that we understand and see that there is the potential for some conflation between the emergency service changes and the Fit for the Future programme, given that there is a small amount of common ground between the two. So we need to carefully manage the consultation and communication to understand um, and ensure that people can see the important and significant differences between the two. And we want to stress again, as we have done in all of our communication, that our commitment to the retention of a Type 1 A&E um, from 8am to 8pm in Cheltenham is not affected by our short-term emergency measure to reallocate it as an MIU. So I'll pause there um, and I'll hand over now to Simon Lansley, um, who's going to talk to you about Annex 1, um, the consideration of the variation to emergency general surgery. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Good morning, everyone. Simon Lansley, so Director of Strategy at uh, Gloucester Hospitals. Um, I just wanted to pick out a few points from the pro forma, um, just to, to help some of the questioning. And, and members, are we aware that the, you know, the risks associated with emergency general surgery have been around for a while? So we've discussed them through hospital previously. And so perhaps it was no surprise that it was one of the services um, to be impacted early on by a reduction in our workforce uh, as a result of the pandemic. Uh, and one, was the, one of the key reasons why we went to, um, to, to centralise that service at Gloucester Royal. Um, the case for centralising and, and separating emergency and active care is well rehearsed and there's some references in the document here, but again, we've already heard from some of those before about um, the college support and, and national support for separating emergency and elective care. Uh, and important to, to remember that all our uh, consultants support the current centralisation to, to Gosha Royal um, for emergency services. I think there's a helpful patient story in the pro forma. So, um, story of Kate, uh, and it, it sort of amplifies the way that uh, the benefits of that centralised service. Um, so without that two surgeon model, um, there would have been a risk that Kate would have been operated on by an upper GI surgeon and, and possibly a higher chance of having a stoma. Um, and the model that we've got in place enables us to have both an upper GI consultant and a colorectal consultant on call 24 seven. So it means we can stream those patients to those subspecialty services. Um, so I think that story hopefully brings it to life a bit in some of the benefits. The risks, um, I say, we, we the risks have been in public for a while now. We've debated them through HOS. Um, I won't go through each one, but I think it's important to say that as a result of the centralisation, five of the extreme risks have been reduced. There's now three moderate and two high. And the one COVID risks, which related to the um, sustainability of the service, has moved from extreme to low. And finally, um, some of the patient and staff benefits. So um, on, the, on page 22, you'll see some of those bullet points that pick out some of the patient benefits. Um, we've improved our response rate, so the numbers of patients that are seen by a senior decision maker from 81% to, to 93%. Um, we've been able to reduce our out of hours operating. Again, that dual surgeon model supports that. Um, no serious incidents reported since the move went live on the 1st of April. 
uh, and significant benefits for our workforce. So we've been able to remove gaps in the rota. So the challenges that we had of running two rotors across two hospitals, clearly if we centralise that, we've been able to remove those gaps. So that just improves safety for patients, uh, improves health and wellbeing for staff as well. Um, further on in the pro forma, it talks about all the engagement that we've done. Again, a bit of a link to fit the future, um, but I'll take that section as read and, and happy to take questions. Thank you, Simon, and thank you, Alan, for uh, your presentations. I've got, uh, at the moment, um, Steve Lydon and um, Paul Hodgkinson willing to want to just ask questions, and possibly Martin Norwood, because his hands um, have gone up again or still up. Uh, so I'll go to Steve Lydon first for your question, Steve. Oh, thank you. And firstly, uh, I think all of us would take this chance to go on the public record to thank you and all the staff in the various NHS organisations for the magnificent jobs you've done during all the crisis. Um, and uh, very much appreciate that in these strange times. Um, however, and always, however, I'm glad you've mentioned the, the point that there could be confusion over what are temporary changes and what are changes coming out of fit for the future. And I, I have to say this, that I think there would be a view from some people, and possibly me included, the cynic in me says, are we using the opportunities that are availing to us to actually, using the temporary ones to actually become almost permanent? And I get confused as well between what's temporary and what's pilot. And I think it's important that early on, we actually really are clear about the difference between the two. And then we're not using this as a reason. And I think we need, you almost need to make an authoritative statement. We're not using this as a reason to actually try things out using COVID as the excuse that will actually become a permanent change, which then gets entitled fit for the future. Um, and I think it's really important we nail this down because otherwise we'll, if we get confused, the public will get confused and people will smell rap. So appreciate your candid views on this. Do you want to respond on that? I'll respond in terms of the um, the pilot question, Steve. I think to um, to pilot a service change in the period uh, during a pandemic would not be the right thing to do. Um, and I think we've been clear before that um, the mechanism for permanent change is the Fit for the Future programme. And we've always said that that public consultation period um, uh, pre-COVID, that, that would have been happening now. But as Ellen's mentioned, we're hoping to get that up and running again in September. Um, so there is, there is. I understand the potential for confusion because you're right. Some of the same, some of the same service changes appear, um, but we should perhaps take confidence from that in that the areas that we went to to make things safe for patients uh, are the same changes that we've been talking about for a while. Uh, and I know I look at hospitals around the country, and they perhaps took longer to get to some of these service changes because they hadn't done that thinking beforehand. So I, I think we were slightly ahead of the game that we knew some of the service changes because we know that they would make it safer for patients and more sustainable. Um, so perhaps that's some of the areas we went to first to respond, to be able to respond to that pandemic. And Stephen, I would just add, because I absolutely endorse what Simon has said, the drivers for the temporary changes that we're talking about today were absolutely uh, the impact of the pandemic. Uh, and whilst they're absolutely not pilots, which have a start and end point and objectives that we evaluate against, et cetera. And we do have an opportunity to learn and we should take that opportunity because um, it may mean that when we come out to consult on our permanent changes, that they are nuanced or indeed they are different because of what we have had the opportunity to learn. We've talked about lots of silver linings, haven't we, to the tragedy that is um, the COVID pandemic. So we are looking really closely at what's serving as well and what's not. Uh, and that may mean, as I said, that we knew on some of those changes when, when they come out. I think we can come back, if it's helpful, to another host with some real clarity. We, Simon's produced a really helpful graphic that just describes you know, what's temporary, what's part of it for the future, maps the two across, and it may be that something like that would be helpful. Yeah, I would just come in quickly and say um, the same point, really, that in that in September, when we come back to you, we'll be putting the two alongside each other much more clearly and with the communications that would go with it to the public. Um, so we hope to be able to present that really clearly to you then and obviously take your feedback, um, but echo everything that um, Simon said as well. 
Thank you. Uh, do you need to come back, Stephen, or um, should I move on to... Um, uh... No, just say, I, I thank you, but you can understand where some of the cynical cynicism is coming from. Uh, but thanks for taking the time to answer me. And, and, and I think that's an important role this committee has to um, to ask those questions. So uh, that's good. Uh, Paul, uh, Paul Hodgkinson, I think you're <laughs> the next down for the question. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, no, thanks for, for the NHS staff for taking us through everything and obviously for everything you've done in the last few months. It's been superb. Uh, I think it's really just echoing what Steve, has, Steve Lydon has just said. So um, when I shared the news with the community I represent in the Cotswolds about the, the temporary change in Cheltenham regarding A&E, uh, regarding A&E services coming away from there and going to Gloucester Royal, uh, I had a barrage of sort of comments on social media, which were very sceptical, and I'm being sort of polite in saying that, um, and believing that a temporary situation would simply become permanent at some stage. Now, I do, I have obviously read the report, and I've seen, I think it's twice in the report, you've said this, uh, this is temporary and our commitment remains. Um, but I think you just need to be aware that there is that scepticism out there, and um, people believe that it will simply go on and on and eventually it will become permanent. So I just need to put that out there. Um, also, I guess it's how this is monitored going forward, because clearly you've said yourself, and we all know we're not out of the woods by any means. If you look around the world, the COVID cases are increasing every day, which is very alarming. So we could be in this situation for quite some time. So how do, how do we monitor this? How do we make sure that this doesn't somehow become a permanent fixture because if we carry on and on and on it almost becomes that that's the first question secondly i have read some local media reports that gloucester royal was struggling uh, with a and e being the only a and e in the county now and i'd like to know if that's correct what what we think of that and just the third point was about flu jabs and the point that ellen made about um the fact that this could all come together, um, you know, in a, in a bit of a vicious circle with flu, the winter, uh, coronavirus resurging, etc. Is there a, is there actually a plan around flu jabs and how that's going to work this autumn? Thank you. Okay, should I answer the first point and then I'll hand over to um, Simon regarding the hospital A and E point? And I think there's a couple of us that could potentially answer the flu jabs point. Um, but the first one is, I think, perhaps it will offer some further confidence. As you say, we, we have made the statement um, a significant number of times, and it's in the paper twice. Um, we are confirming um, what we've said all along regarding Chaltamania, and I think that's what you're largely pointing to in terms of some of the cynicism around the changes. Um, it may perhaps give some confidence. I hope it will when our Fit for the Future consultation perhaps actually goes live. And it, and it won't be in there, obviously, um, in terms of the longer term proposals. I suspect the, we will need to keep reiterating that message. I do understand. I think there is a general cynicism anyway um, around these sorts of things. And it's driven from a very real concern and a protective love that people have of their services. So we do fully appreciate where that comes from and understand it. Um, but our commitment is there. We've made it in public. We've made it on Teddy. We've made it in the paper, um, and we'll and we'll keep making it. The process you raise is um, a good point and one that I can't really answer because I think we're learning about this crisis as we go along. I think when I look back to March and how quickly um, things started to spike around the COVID incident, even then our understanding was potentially that this would be a relatively short-lived thing. Um, perhaps the peaks would be steeper and quicker. And then we heard things in the media, didn't we, about herd immunity and so on, that just don't seem to be panning out as our understanding of this disease develops. And obviously, in terms of international and national work on a vaccine, we just don't know how long that's going to take either. So I guess... The only commitment I can give you around the temporary changes is that the process for temporary emergency changes is quite clear. It's set out in our MOU. It talks about this three monthly review and a full risk assessment to support that. 
So we've gone through the first cycle in terms of this first three months, and we're um, about to, um, in September, come and talk about the second lot of changes and their first three months. And I think we'll need to have a discussion, won't we, between us around the best thing to do then in September, as we understand with a few more months of learning and with the winter planning exercise that we will have done, what we think we should put in place um, from for the winter um, this year, taking account of that modelling when we've done it around flu. And I think sitting here today on the 14th of July, we can't say to you exactly what that is because we're learning about this as we go. Um, but it will be based on a proposal that will have been modelled against what we predict um, COVID could look like over the winter, another couple of months of learning about what the disease is doing in our community and nationally, and some proposals that we think will help us to deliver services safely through the winter. Um, and we'll bring that to you as a package in September and talk it through then. I don't know if Simon wants to add anything. Councillor Robinson, I'm happy to, to pick up on a number of points there. Firstly, the point about cynicism, Councillor Hutchinson, it is really well understood. And as you might imagine, we debated long and hard about how this change would be perceived. To have taken full regard of it and not to make the changes would have been to leave services less safe than we have been able to make them. So what we've tried to do is just to remember that the distinctions between temporary and, and permanent changes. I think it is important to note, however, that some are temporary now, but they're also part of our Fit for the Future consultation. So I think it is really important that we don't allow ourselves a narrative that says these temporary changes became permanent by self, because some of them are the same, and they're the same for the reasons that, that Simon alluded to, because they appear to be uh, the right thing to do in terms of the best possible quality of care. But they were preconceived, and there's a well-documented history as part of our Fit for the Future um, trail. Coming to, to some of the specifics in relation to uh, A&E, one of the key measures of how well A&E and, and our urgent care system is performing is the four hour waiting time standard. As you will know, we've talked about it here many times. So just to give you um, some assurance in that respect, performance in June and July uh, was stronger than that in May, despite increases in activity. So we had better four hour performance after the changes than we had before. And the months of July, uh, sorry, the months of May, uh, June and July were stronger than they were this time last year. The first few days been entirely candid. Uh, we dealt with a number of issues and I think that's where some of the uh, concerns emanated from in the first few days. We had two power cuts. Um, we had a bomb scare in Cheltenham that closed the road. So we did have some teething issues, um, but they have uh, settled considerably. Uh, we have had no 12-hour trolley breaches. Our patient transport provider uh, stops service at 10 p.m., so patients are not being uh, transferred in the middle of the night, as was one of uh, the concerns that was expressed through the Gloucestershire Live article. So uh, our perspective, and again, back to that clinically-led, uh, being monitored by our clinicians. You asked the question about metrics and evaluation. Each one of our changes has a set of measures that we're looking at continually to assure ourselves that this uh, is working as we expected it to. And they track back to those three primary goals of reducing the risk of transmission, promoting public confidence in our services, and in doing so, being able to return to some of the former levels of activity that we previously saw. A, because patients want to come back to care, but also because our pathways uh, enable us to provide all of the care safely without that, that risk of transmission. And then finally, on flu, uh, we have a really great track record in Gloucestershire. We were the highest performing system in the Southwest region last year across all of the organisations at Gloucester Health and Care, as well as ourselves. In terms of staff flu vaccination, we reached the magical uh, 80%, uh, which was our best performance ever. And we've already started our planning and campaign for this year. I think this year's challenge is going to be different. I don't think any of our staff will need persuading of the merits of flu vaccination this year. That's a positive. I think our challenge will be the community uh, and what the government and Public Health England decide is the right model for community vaccination. Those that are eligible now, it's a relatively narrow and defined group. Um, and we're, we're still waiting to hear whether the group that receive flu vaccination that live in the community will be extended. 
Um, Sarah Scott knows much more than I do about these vaccination programmes, so I don't know whether Sarah wants to, to add anything, but they're my thoughts and reflections. Could briefly come in. I do know Mary Hutton maybe would like to say a few words on this as well. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Sarah. I wasn't going to add anything. I think Deb covered it really, really well. The one thing I was going to say is that, of course, all the actions we're taking to prevent COVID in terms of social distancing, hand washing, are all really effective um, control measures for seasonal flu and norovirus. So it could be that we see you know, a, a reduced number of these um, um, cases of these other diseases during the winter, which would be extremely welcome because our, hopefully the public and, and, and our, our communities will still be taking or, um, these additional control measures. So that, that remains to be seen, but it still doesn't stop our planning. And flu planning now is a year long round activity for us and, and the health service. I think just, just to add there, I think the, the biggest risk we have going into to winter um, is the social distancing challenge because people uh, understandably will not be outdoors. Uh, life won't be outdoors in the way it has in summer. So as Sarah said, if we can keep those messages going, particularly about hand washing, but I think we all recognise that the winter um, presents us with some challenges that are, that are quite hard to overcome. Hence our, hence our planning for a, a likely second spike at some point during winter. Can I just comment on the, the issue about the next phase of COVID and what we do? So we're, we're working with the national and regional teams to understand all the data around COVID and trying to understand um, what the scenarios might look like. So as part of our winter plan, we will have a number of scenarios. And one of the key, um, I suppose, issues that we will rely on locally is the public health local outbreak management plan and Sarah can talk at length about Operation Spanish Oak where we tested out our thinking last week to see if we can pick up spikes quickly locally then we can obviously avert um, a significant growth in COVID numbers in, in Gloucestershire so that would be significant for us so when we come back in September we'll be talking about our winter plan which will have quite a lot of development we're developing our thinking around urgent care we've been using as you know synapses can we develop that further so people can be seen in their community Working with 111, we've got some more clinical support in 111 now. Can we actually help people where they are rather than transporting them, working with the Ambulance Trust as well? In terms of flu, the, the issues um, have been outlined already around safety, but we're talking about um, drive-through um, flu vaccination um, offers and a number of other offers. So that planning is well underway now and we'll be um, in Gloucester ready to meet the timeline when 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 we when we're ready to start that flu vaccination. So a lot of work underway, but it will be different. And as right. we're not entirely clear on the cohorts that will be covered. So we need to have an extensive plan. And certainly there is an outline plan already. Thank you. Um Paul, Paul, is there uh, do you want to come back on that or shall I move on to the next question? No, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you, then. Uh, the next person to indicate, uh, Martin, is that right? You want to come in? Yes, please. Yeah, OK, Martin, you're next. <clears throat> um, first of all, can I just echo a few things that have been said, especially the thanks to frontline uh, members of your staff um, in, the, in the NHS and the wider care community. And I think um, all of us are just um, enormously indebted to them for their, for their courage and dedication through all this. Um, but also to reiterate some of the points that have been made by Councillor Hodgkinson, Councillor Lydon and others, um, and to say it's not the, the, the fear that these temporary changes will be sort of uh, transmogrified into permanent ones um, and the, the launching or the relaunching, if you like, of the Fit for the Future consultation in the middle of the pandemic um, or while the pandemic is still ongoing is obviously one that does give rise uh, to cynicism, but it's not just about cynicism and it's not just about, uh, I think somebody said, love of service, or people love their local services. This is also based on the lengthy process we went through before over these service changes, which included dozens and dozens of consultants and clinical specialists expressing their extreme alarm about them and how they thought that they would result in less safe services. So these are really serious issues. And to try and assess those on the basis of learning, while this strange situation of a pandemic is going on, seems to me quite an unsafe uh, plan. Um, we know, for instance, that cancer referrals were sharply down. Other referrals will be down. Um, these are not typical times in which to assess how services are working. 
Having said that, the paper does uh, highlight some things quite usefully. On page 16, I notice uh, in the accessibility stats, we've seen the first concrete evidence that this does actually disadvantage people in Cheltenham, I'm afraid. Um, so the changes in accessibility, you have 481 patients during the period survey negatively affected uh, from Cheltenham against only 156 positively affected from um, the Forest and Gloucester. And with a very large number in this neutral period, which still could be actually uh, negatively affected, just not quite as much. Um, and that's quite an important learning to, uh, to draw as well. And uh, like others, I've heard anecdotal evidence of Gloucester A&E not being able to cope. We've heard of effectively traffic jams of ambulances unable to admit patients to A&E, presumably because of uh, the kind of bed capacity issues that we, that we raised before. Um, but I want to ask uh, four very specific questions. Um, Deborah, you said that the, there had been no cross infections on COVID-19 patient to patient or uh, staff to patient or vice versa. Uh, during June, but of course these changes happened in April and the caseload was much higher in April and May than it has been in June. So uh, can you just confirm what the situation has been for April and May? And then my third and fourth, uh, my second and third questions rather are both based on the, the REACH presentation. Um, can we just have an explanation given that uh, we were trying to we thought separate the sort of red and green um, scenarios, why elective surgery hasn't been moved to Cheltenham General, and in particular, why some things like arterial vascular surgery, which Reach highlighted, have actually moved the other way. So elective, more elective surgery has moved to, to Gloucester Royal in a case like, like that. That seems to be the reverse of the national guidance. Um, and then thirdly, but also from, from the REACH uh, questions, the closure of the emergency theatre at Cheltenham General seems to necessitate the removal of patients who are already undergoing elective surgery, so are already higher risk, but then have complications, so are at even higher risk, to a site which has COVID-19 at Gloucester. So again, that seems like a very dangerous uh, scenario. And it's great that we haven't had those cross infections yet, but. Uh, it would be horrible if we then looked at the data in six months' time and realised that there had been people who, uh, you know, uh, had a, well, I don't want to say who died because of this, but but who were put at much greater risk because of these uh, changes. So if we could have an explanation for that, the rationale behind or the, an assurance that the, the closure of that emergency theatre at CGH is, uh, is safe. Um, and then... Finally, um, we are conflating these permanent and temporary changes, especially in relation to the closure of the A&E, the daytime A&E at Cheltenham General. And we've heard very careful phrasing about this. But can we just have a just a very clear answer to the question? After these temporary changes, will a type one A&E be restored at Cheltenham General? Thank you. Okay, um, let me take as many of those, Martin, as I can remember. And you'll probably have to jog my, my memory. I didn't catch all of the points. Um, I think we captured it in the minutes of the last host meeting, but I'm happy to reiterate um, that the changes that have been acted as part of the temporary changes relating to the operating hours of Cheltenham ED, both overnight and as a type of AE, will be reverted at the end of the temporary change period. Um, I have to be really open and candid and clear that we don't know when that period is yet, but we have got an MOU that guides our decision making around when uh, the temporary changes come to an end. Uh, pick off a couple of the more straight forward ones. Why did I quote the statistics for nosocomial infection for June? Um, because the, the key point of change was on the 9th of June when we separated the um, acute medical take and brought all of our emergency patients through the Gloucestershire Royal Front Door. You might recollect that the biggest risk to nosocomial transmission, that's transmission between patients and staff, uh, relates to the undifferentiated acute take. So that happened on, uh, forgive me, the 9th of June, not the 8th of June, uh, and that's why I referenced that point. What we can uh, evidence is that the rate of uh, transmission within hospital dropped uh, initially dropped uh, earlier than that when we took out some of our uh, bed base to create social distancing between our patients. 
Um, so happy to provide further information on that, but that's why I chose the, the period. So there were infections prior to that. We attribute them to the model that was in play, which was uh, offered undifferentiated acute emergencies coming in to undifferentiated pathways. Uh, the changes on the 9th of June allowed us to separate a number of pathways, including creating two separate assessment areas in our GRHED, uh, indeed three separate areas, because we had confirmed COVID, suspected COVID and confirmed negative. And we weren't able to do that six times in the county. We couldn't replicate that model on both of our sites, which is why we went down the route we did. In relation Sorry, to- can I, can I just very quickly come back on that? The reason I, I picked on April was because in your report on page 11, it says that the emergency service change was actually enacted on 1st of April though. So I wasn't asking for general, the rationale for, for it. We, we've discussed and accept the rationale, but the yeah. the question was about whether can we have the the same cross infection information for April and May as you've so, uh, reassured. So we can provide that. We can we can provide that. But I'd like to be really clear um, with colleagues as as you're being with me. And the emergency general surgery change was to deal with extreme workforce issues that had been long standing and well documented and exacerbated by uh, the workforce impacts of COVID. That's why we enacted that change in April. It wasn't to deal with the issue of uh, transmission risk of the virus. The changes on the 9th of June were our attempts to address that, which is why the measure relating to uh, virus transmission was a measure reported for the period after that change. So the emergency general surgery pathway was not a response to the risk of transmitting COVID between patients. So coming to your other points, um, unless that's that's not clear, um, Cheltenham General Hospital, uh, we have options. So we still have an out of hours um, theatre capability at Cheltenham. So um, if a patient were to deteriorate and we considered their transfer to Gloucestershire Royal not to be in their best interest, not to be a safe step, then we can stand up the theatre and we can operate there. We've only had one occasion when we needed to um, make that decision and the decision taken by the managing surgeons was to transfer the patient to Gloucestershire Royal. Uh, it went without incident, they had uh, a good outcome and the uh, decision to operate uh, to table time was comparable to that which would have previously been achieved at, at Cheltenham. So, it, so a good outcome, but if there was a, a patient where it was deemed that surgery was required and the patient wasn't well enough, to transfer, then we can still mobilise that Cheltenham theatre out of hours. In relation to vascular surgery, and this, this goes back to my earlier comments of trying to balance the whole of this model with the individual preferences of specific services. So our, our primary goal around transmission risk was to, as I've said, create those three separate pathways of entry for emergency patients. Um, everyone's in agreement that we couldn't have manage the emergency pathway for vascular um, in isolation at Cheltenham, that it needed to follow the model of all uh, acute emergencies coming through those three different doors that we were only able to mobilise at Gloucestershire Royal. Um, some services, because of the critical mass, the number of patients, the number of staff, surgeons, etc., cetera, um, can operate as two separate services on different sites. That isn't the case uh, with vascular. It's a relatively uh, small service. It was the preference of the majority of surgeons, I've been very open and candid about this, that we maintained the elected pathway at Cheltenham and they were given several opportunities. We had several meetings where we invited them to put forward a model uh, that was safe, that would enable us to run two separate services uh, and they weren't able to do that. Uh, so we looked very hard. Uh, I can see that there are some uh, benefits of that model, but overall um, our, our Resident was to ensure that the whole model was safe, including the model uh, for vascular surgery. And we couldn't identify, nor could the surgeons, a model that enabled us to retain a safe elective pathway for complex vascular patients at Cheltenham, given the necessity to bring the emergency pathway to Gloucestershire Royal. So that's three points, but I, there was a fourth, Martin, wasn't there? So remind me what your fourth was. I think it was your first as well. Uh, no, you have. I think you have answered all four. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Thank you for the responses. Uh, right, we're going to go to Dillis now, who um, has a question. 
Uh, yes, it, it's it's mostly sort of slightly a thought rather than a, a question, but there is a question at the end of it. So um, having worked for the NHS for nearly 40 years, um, decisions are made these days uh, based on, on evidence rather than... Uh, um, other things are obviously important. You obviously have to, to, uh, to ask for public opinion. Um, people come up with anecdotal evidence, people come up with theories, but ultimately... Uh, it's the evidence base which is important for making decisions. Um, so, uh, for example, in the Fit for the Future consultation, um, people are being widely consulted, but the aim is to make um, the treatment as safe as possible, first and foremost, and then as close to home as possible. And my, my understanding is that this is what um, is trying to be achieved it, it, during this COVID epidemic. Um, but the, the, the difficulty in the COVID epidemic is that the, the evidence isn't altogether there. So my guess is, is um, uh, I think Ellen said that um, we're learning all the time and that we'll be able to make uh, further decisions in September. And um, I do think it's, it's crucial that we, that we understand that. Um, um, it, it's good to know that uh, uh, if this, this, uh, the current setup that we've got between Cheltenham and Gloucester doesn't seem to be working if it suggests that uh, 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 tackling the is issues of separating COVID and non-COVID patients, where to do elective surgery, etc., could be managed better than uh, the way it's being managed now. M my guess is that um, the, the, uh, the, the trust uh, would be willing to look at altering the way that they're managing patients when, when the evidence is actually there. So that's the first, first thing, is there's some flexibility in the system. If when the evidence comes forward, it shows that this isn't the best way to manage things. And, um, and then the second thing is, um, uh, I, was, I was talking about the importance of the evidence base and it's been uh, the, the, the rationale for having a, a specialist service for emergency general service, general surgery at, at Cheltenham. Uh, a paper by the Royal College of Surgeons was quoted um, in, in the report. Uh, but the REACH people also quoted something from the BMJ uh, about the incidence of post-op COVID infections and death in elective patients, um, saying that 20% of patients who contracted COVID after elective surgery um, had died. And I just wondered if, if there was any record of uh, how many patients had uh, in, in, in our trust had contracted COVID um, after elective surgery and how many of those had died. So that's really my only question. The rest of it is just my personal opinion, really. And, I, and I'm really happy to respond to that. It gives me an opportunity to emphasize a point that I think is, is not one and not a point that we perhaps have made clearly enough, because I think we are in danger of slipping into a sort of parlance that, that views um, Cheltenham as a kind of clean green site and Gloucestershire Royal as a as a red and potentially uh, uh, highly infected site. What the Gloucestershire Royal Estate has enabled us to do in terms of this response is to create sufficient space to manage those three different pathways of, of entry that I talked about. So the confirmed COVID, the definitely not COVID and the suspected awaiting swab results. So um, I want to be really, really clear, Delis, with yourself and colleagues that because the patient comes into Gloucestershire Royal, it doesn't expose them uh, to greater risk than it does uh, at Cheltenham. However, when we looked at replicating that model on both of our sites, both the estate and the availability of workforce didn't allow us to do it uh, twice. So, um, you know, Martin was, was quite right to draw attention to the travel impact. And there are greater numbers of patients that have moved uh, this way than the other direction as part of that, that medical take, but they've moved this way to access safer care. Uh, and better outcomes and most of the patients that I uh, come into contact with think that's a, a journey that's worth making in in these particularly unique times whether they'll feel that in the longer term is part of what we're we're testing and consulting upon as part of the fit for the future uh, experience so I just wanted to to make that that point really clear uh, I've seen the data relating to uh, infection as I said back in March before we um, learned from some of the international and national evidence around the impact of social distancing before we moved and separated our beds, introduced screens, enacted these changes. And um, we did have uh, a number of patients. They weren't specifically elective patients. They were predominantly emergency patients. But we did have, uh, the last data set I saw in June, we did have 46 patients 
who we've got reasonable confidence to believe contracted COVID whilst they were in our, our care. Um, so that's 46 more than we would ever have wanted. Uh, it was less than 0.2% of all the patients we treated. And it certainly didn't put us in a, a benchmark group that suggested we were in any way out of the ordinary. In fact, quite the opposite. We've had a really strong track record in this space. But of course, it's very disappointing. Uh, and a very small number of those, I believe it was 11, um, went on to die. They, they may have died in any event because this is a very vulnerable and ill group. But there were patients who came into our hospitals without COVID who contracted it. And that's um, a really sorry and sad situation. But as I've said, it, it's, it's the nature of the pandemic and it's, it's something that characterised um, all of the acute hospitals that I've looked into. The really important thing, I think, for us in Gloucestershire was how quickly we picked that up, how quickly we responded and learned. In fact, what we did in Gloucestershire in relation to social distancing of beds and screens has been held up as a, as a national exemplar. In fact, we're now a national pilot site for our approach. So um, jumped on it quickly and have now got some of the best outcomes nationally. Thank you for, for the questions and responses. I've got nobody else indicating, so I think we're now going to go back to Ellen because we haven't yet covered the uh, minor injury units. So um, if Steph actually could come back in and uh, we'll take that point. Thank you, Chair. Well, I'm actually going to hand straight over to Anne Potter um, from Gloucester Health and Care who's going to talk you through the second minor injuries unit um, pro forma. Good morning, everybody. Um, hopefully you can hear me at uh, this time when you couldn't when I said hello. Um, so in relation to the minor injury unit changes, um, I, I won't reiterate and repeat much of what Ellen has said in terms of the background to the COVID. The, the main drivers in terms of the, the challenges that were faced in relation to the minor injury units was the ongoing resilience offer that were predominantly driven by um, staffing challenges, which were obviously a exacerbated both through sickness um, and um, staff shielding as a consequence of, of, of COVID and indeed the need for us to consider how we utilise the workforce that was available to us um, as we move through the pandemic. So the, the first three months of, of changes was enacted on the 22nd of March, and that resulted in reducing the hours of operation at four of the sites being Lydney, North Cotswold, Sirencester and Stroud, and closing the units at Tewkesbury, Dilk and the Vale. Um, and, and they were predominantly because the, the Dilk and, and Tewkesbury were going to be designated as our um, red COVID positive sites. And um, we felt that it was safe to manage the flow between um, the Vale and Stroud, um, maintaining Stroud as the specialist stroke unit from its inpatient perspective. So um, since we have instigated those changes, <clears throat> we um, remain with an issue of um, resilience. So resilience has improved. Um, there have been um, a significant reduction in closures due to staff shortages as a consequence of um, the, the, the implementation of the reduced sites. But we do have ongoing concerns in terms of environmental factors and the need to manage flow through the units um, from a social distancing perspective. Um, so that's why one of the reasons we'll be looking at moving forward is how we balance flow coming into the units and potentially looking at how we work with um, NHS 111, who currently operate a um, telephone triage service for those patients that access urgent care to those routes and are able to utilise a planned uh, booking system. And that may be something that we look at further moving forward. But obviously we've increased public awareness in terms of the closures and we've had no incidents or complaints since the um, change has been instigated as a result of the closures. And we've been able to manage safely the flow through um, the units. It's fair to say that activity levels still remain significantly below normal as a, as a result probably of public awareness of the heightened risk and indeed the different change in behaviours. 
and, and we are very closely monitoring those activity patterns in terms of ongoing demand both to ourselves and working with GHT in terms of any impact to their units um, in terms of managing um, expectations and capacity across the whole system. So at the moment, we have a situation whereby we would wish to retain the current um, changes we will be trying to move the four units that are closed to an eight till eight opening hours so that we're returning them to an extended period of time. But we don't feel that we would be in a position to reopen the other three units um, during the, the, the three month requested extension. So that's sort of where I, I would potentially leave it. In terms of the risks that are outlined um, within the document, they um, are all being safely mitigated through the changes. As I say, they predominantly relate to the resilience of the units and keeping people safe and aware of the services that are on offer and where they're on offer. So we feel it's a it's much safer response to have clarity of those units that are open rather than the, the risk of changing and closing at short notice because of resilience offers. So I will leave it there and happy to take any questions or clarifications um, on the request. Thank you, Angela. Uh, we have a question from Nigel. Nigel Robbins. Uh, th uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Angela and um, Ellen. Yes, uh, the figures are really un rather interesting, aren't they, for the MIU usage? Um, even in the more popular or more used centres like uh, Stroud and Cotswolds, the numbers have gone down significantly uh, in response to the awareness of the COVID crisis. Does this mean that a large number, as is often speculated in the press, a large number of visits to MIUs are actually unnecessary? Or does it indicate that um, things like synapses are being used much more in, in consultation with local GPs. I mean, you indicated you're analysing it. It would be really interesting to find out what the reality is. Thanks. I think it's fair to say that we are still looking at that. But one of the things that we are aware of is the different response that primary care offered in terms of um, the way in which people respond very rapidly to the telephone approach from primary care in receiving their, certainly their minor illness usage. And we know that historically there has been a split in, in terms of the injury and illness utilisation. So it's something that certainly we will continue to revisit and, and analyse the exact diagnosis codes of what people have been attending the MIU units for and compare that to pre-COVID um, patterns of behaviour. Um, because I think it will give us a very interesting analysis for us to consider moving forward. But I don't have that readily to hand now. OK, thanks. Thank you. You're happy with that, Nigel. Uh, I don't have anybody else uh, looking to um, uh, Oh yeah, uh, ask a question at the moment. So um, if that's where we are, we'll, we'll accept the update um, as we are. I move on, I think, then to the Fit for the Future um, part, which is um, Mary Hutton to uh, um, introduce it. Well, I've got a lot of my colleagues on the call who are absolute experts in this. So all I was going to do was just share with you the um, timeline that we're, we're planning around Fit for the Future. So um, as you'll be aware, work is continuing on um, Fit for the Future plans. And the future timeline is this. So we're working on the detail around Fit for the Future um, dur during July. And in August, then we've set up our meetings with um, NHS England Improvement to look at stage two assurance during August. And in September, then we, we believe we'd be ready to launch consultation with public boards and HOSC. And we have planned um, a virtual citizens jury, which will be interesting in, uh, in November. And so therefore we would have September to December would be our consultation. We have got, um, um, software, which Becky can talk about, which is around um, supporting virtual consultation. And then we'd have January to February to consider the outcome from the consultation, the feedback, and then to move on to agreeing plans and implementation. So I don't know if it would be helpful if I've got any questions about the methodology we use for consultation. I'm sure Becky can update on that. So the main message is working through our assurance process, September to 
um, November being September to December being the consultation on the next stage of fit for the future. And we plan to work on the Forest of Dean according to a similar timeline. Thank you, Mary. Um, right, I don't have anybody. Oh, yes, we do. Uh, I'll come to Martin Forward. He's got a question. Yes, yeah, sorry. I just, um, Mary, I didn't quite follow the process of consultation between September and December. Um, but that, that was first to Hosk and public bodies. And then when is it a public consultation? Um, and I hope it doesn't run over Christmas again. <laughs> Um, but I'm also just curious about whether you really think it's safe to, to go through this process with the you know potential implementation, presumably, when? Uh, it would be nice to know that as well. If we've, as we've just heard from Deborah, got to revert back to the uh, pre-epidemic type 1 A&E in Cheltenham, for instance, after the uh, temporary changes, and while we're in the middle of a pandemic, when, as we've heard, lots of the data and lots of the usage, and lots of the patterns of uh, work are completely atypical. Yeah, I, I suppose I feel that maybe you feel the same. We've been talking about this fit for the future consultation for far too long. I feel I feel it's, it, we need to we need to move forward with this. What I've said is that September to December would be the consultation. We would launch that consultation with a HOSC and public boards in September. And then we worked through, and we planned um, a citizen's jury, a virtual citizen's jury in November as part of our consultation process. Then we move on in the new year to implementation. A lot of this will depend, of course, on COVID and what we do around COVID. So we have to follow this through. But some of these plans are so are based on our long term, we said medium to long term, they're not about the short term issues. And we have already written a lot of our PCBC, our pre-consultation business case, and that information still stands. We're not assuming COVID will be around for the next 20 years. No, but the, sorry, through you, Chair, the, that, that still doesn't explain when a public consultation is happening. Public consultation, to September to December. No, but you said first to the HOSC and public bodies. Is no. that simultaneous public, public bodies, consultation? HOSC and public bodies will launch the consultation effectively in September, September to December. So public consultation. The yes. wider, so the wider public will yes. be able to participate yes. in that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, okay, from September. Yeah. And then, so that, uh, but you're talking about implementation. Again, quite possibly, while well, we've still got temporary changes in place. So I well, think implementation plan square with what Deborah told us earlier. No, I think what I said was that in obviously in December we'd finish the consultation, we'd analyse the output of consultation and any issues and in terms of feedback, and then we'd work through to implementation plans in the new year. Of course, we've got to take into consideration that services have to remain safe, and we have to, uh, if COVID remains a significant issue for us in the new year, then we have to deal with that issue as part of implementation plans. So. Just to be absolutely 100% clear, we're talking only about implementation plans, not actual implementation before the temporary COVID changes have been reversed. Well, this is a clear message on out of, out of the consultation on specific issues that fits with our temporary plans. I guess we can move ahead with those. We have to work that through in an implementation plan in, I, I would suspect, in January, February. I kind of understand how this is very confusing. This seems reasonably straightforward to me. We go out and do... It's not confusing. It's just that feedback. we've just been told that the, the temporary changes would revert. But it's quite possible. We might be in the second wave of the pandemic over winter. And you're talking about implementation next from January onwards of permanent can I, change. Can I just... So that doesn't can I just seem to square in, with what we were told earlier. Can I just come in briefly? Um the way it works when we complete a consultation so we would complete it's ellen i don't know if you can see me on the video yeah, um yeah good um the way the process runs is there's always um some periods of reflection and consideration so our proposal is that we start the consultation in mid-september as mary described that would run until early december so quite well before christmas 
Um, and then we have a period of time where obviously we write up and collate all of that feedback and we usually expect to get a considerable amount. So that does take us a little bit of time to analyse and consider properly. And then what we do is because we are working with a couple of different options and we take the consultation feedback into account and then obviously um, evidence base and so on has been referred to earlier and all the analysis that we've done and it's based on our long term data, not as has been mentioned, what might be happening in the short term, because um, we've already modelled that based on, you know, our population projections and our years going back for about the last, well, a number of years that we've been working on this now. So in January and February, we go into what's called due regard and consideration. So we have to knit together all of those different pieces of evidence. So what's been um, put to us in the consultation, which may cause us to amend some of our plans, obviously, because that's the point of the consultation, the work we've done in the business case. And then we take what is at this stage a pre-consultation business case with a number of proposals in it. Quite well worked up, but still proposals. And in that January, February time, we have to develop that into a proper business case. And we have to then take that back into our own governance processes, ensuring we have due regard in our public board meetings and so on. And then from March, we would start to either implement or develop our implementation plans. So in Fit for the Future, you'll be aware that some of it is about our longer term vision, as well as um, specifics around services. And so, of course, we don't just implement the minute we've written the business case. We have to plan for that and we have to phase it. And implementation of any permanent change has to take account of the current situation obviously happening in our services on the ground. So if we were still next March in a point of needing to have a COVID incident response in play, we'll need to factor that into our business case and our implementation plans, and we would responsibly expect to do that. But we still believe that it's the right thing to do to consult and plan for the long-term permanent changes that we've been talking about for now three, four years as part of our strategic intent. So just to sort of frame that, that's the sort of time scale we're looking at. Um, there is always that period after um, consultation to reflect and plan. And, and that's where we would take those factors into account that you mentioned, Martin, about where we are with regard to the incident and the temporary changes. Uh, I think that uh, that probably answers that question. Uh, I've got Phyllis looking to uh, ask a question. Uh, so we'll pick that up and then probably... Um, close this item and move on to the next one. So, Dillis, would you like to come in? Yes, uh, it was just about the public consultation, which is obviously really crucial. It's going to be a little bit different this time because of, uh, because of the COVID restrictions and restrictions on meetings. I, I attended an excellent group previously, um, a face-to-face -face group uh, in the consultation beforehand. So, how, how, how are you anticipating um, publicising the public consultations and and are you going to be setting up virtual groups or just relying on questionnaires? Just could you just uh, I'd like to be, I'd like to make my residents available of, aware of how they can make their opinions felt. I might just ask Becky to comment on this because she's been working on this for. for oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Becky, Becky, if you have a comment, you tell them. Sure, I'd be happy to talk about it. Um, Dillis, we will um, make available um, to you the, the detailed consultation plan that we're putting together at the moment. Um, but just to um, provide members with some reassurance, clearly um, we need to think a little bit differently um, in the, the times of a pandemic. Um, we can't rely on some of the more traditional methods um, that we've used before. Um, so. Rather helpfully um, and um, uh, prescient in, in some ways, we had already um, begun to investigate um, wider use of online engagement and consultation methods. So we have recently purchased um, some new software which is going to enable us to hold online discussion forums, um, conduct short surveys, quick polls, um, have chats with people, um, uh, which we are currently receiving our training on, and it will all be ready um, and available for us to use for the Fit for the Future work that we're planning this autumn. 
this doesn't necessarily mean that we won't um, attempt to do some face-to-face -face engagement um, because we appreciate that the online um, offer will not work for everybody. Um, but obviously we need to do that in such a way to maintain social distance, et cetera. And obviously we'll be monitoring very, very closely how the, um, how the pandemic progresses over the next few months and indeed into the winter period. Um, something that may be of interest to members is that we are um, working closely with Gloucestershire County Council colleagues who have um, fairly recently, and you'll probably be aware of this, um, uh, offered, um, provided grants to various community and voluntary sector organisations across the county to mitigate against some of the issues to do with digital exclusion. Um, so it's called, I've just looked it up myself, it's called the Digital um, uh, Innovation Fund. £200,000 have been um, allocated within the county to support different communities in improving their access to online um, facilities and we are going to be working closely with the organisers of that um, to uh, to see where we can take opportunities to um, to use um, digital online um, consultation methods within those communities. So there will be a very comprehensive plan, Dillis. I'll make sure that it's shared with the um, with members of scrutiny and it will form part of our presentation to the September HOSC. Um, but rest assured, me and my team and colleagues across the ICS We'll be doing our level best to make sure that everyone has their opportunity to have their say, um, albeit in a slightly different way um, from how we might traditionally have done it before. All right, thank you. Thank you for the update. Um, I think uh, we'll all be looking forward to the September meeting where we get the um, detailed proposals for the consultation. Um, so a useful, useful update at the present time. So I'm now going to move on to the um, next item on the agenda. Um, this is the um, performance report um, on the from the clinical commissioning group. Uh, I think, bearing in mind we're sort of um, two hours into the meeting, uh, I'm inclined to take that as a as a report that's read and go straight into questions. And I, I would like to add some comments okay, if Mary, possible, let, Brian, because I've got you, some updated information, yeah. if that's possible. I thought this performance report was particularly important after our conversations earlier in the meeting because clearly a priority for the system is to build confidence and to build capacity. So I've just I've just got somebody just to check um, some updated information for me on this report. So I wanted just to give that information to host today. So on starting just with ED, first of all, we said in the report that um, May was 89.2%, June system performance for Gloucestershire was 902 and the last week ending the 5th of July was 89.8. So the performance is improving. Now activity is still below in June the pre-COVID levels, but from week commencing the 22nd of June, we've seen a significant rise in activity, and that was reflecting back to um, June 19 levels. And obviously our MIUs are uh, working against targets. So I've already referenced the winter plan. We will be doing a significant piece of work with 111. We've had significant activity through 111 as people had to go to 111 to check their symptoms and also their destination for treatment. And we've got some extra clinical involvement and we need to have a plan really to understand how we manage that for, for, the, for the winter to keep our activity in line. So just to say on ambulance, um, activity, it talks about in the report about significantly down, 4.5% reduction in activity still on the ambulance. So that's not, not it's, it's, it's a reduction, but it's not that significant, I would say. And the activity, the category one target is being delivered overall in Gloucestershire and nearly being delivered overall for the whole of SWAST across the country. And I just want to mention detox, that's important because detox are, are, are lower than they would have been pre-COVID, the transit of care. So we would have had about 40 a day pre-COVID. These are down to about 15 to 19 a day. Um, and the discharge work is working very well across the system. Of course, we have resources significantly during COVID and we're now trying to work through how do we carry on that significant um, focus on discharge as we work through with probably a different level of resource after COVID. I particularly wanted to focus on cancer and um, the two-week wait issue where we talked about our concern about um, reduction in referrals and that was a very significant concern due to patient confidence at the beginning of COVID. So for the two-week wait for cancer in the report, you've got the April figures, which show 90.6. Now, for me, it's 90.8. So we're really, um, really massively overachieving against that target um, for two-week waits. But of course, we have a 
significant reduction in referrals for two week, for cancer services, and that would be a concern. So just to um, share with you the figures for referrals compared to last year. In March, we had about 76% referrals compared to last year. In April, 49%, May, 74%. But in June, for two-week referrals, we're back to 100% of June last year referrals. So referrals have picked up again. So we just need to keep it, people keeping to come back and report their, their issues around cancer. And in the report, you'll see there are still issues with delivery around cancer um, of 62-day wait. And diagnostics uh, is another area that's been a significant challenge but now we're beginning to see um, a steady increase in the diagnostic available provision, including the community provision that now is back on track. And so we're seeing a significant reduction and lost shares doing better on diagnostics than the rest of the Southwest. And I've mentioned, I've mentioned the report, the referral to treatment, the weights in the system, and those are, those are, those are a significant issue for us. There's something in the report about IAPT as well. There's a, there's a reduction in access to IAPT, and we think that's down to public behaviour and a lot of work ongoing to um, improve that behaviour. So I think there's some some nuggets of hope in that performance report and that information I've just given you. I hope you believe. I hope you agree. Thank you, Barry. Yes, uh, quite a lot of uh, information packed in, in there and in the report. I haven't at the moment got anybody looking to ask a question on that. Um, so um, I think we will say thank you very much for the report um, and then uh, move on to the... We have, uh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, Martin, did you, did you want to speak but not get your hand up? Uh, I had my hand up too, actually, Brian. My, my hand's up. <laughs> well, I, I did see Look. your hands, I thought you hadn't put it down. So let's go to Nigel first because it was up and then I'll come to Martin who's um, just put his hand up. Uh, thanks, uh, Mary. Um, ambulance response times. Um, I'm sure the people in the Cotswolds and in the Forest of Dean are very pleased that the more central areas in Tewkesbury are hitting the targets quite com the first um, category target quite comfortably. But nothing is improving as far as the rural areas are concerned. I want some reassurance that the sighting of ambulance stations is being continuously looked at so that we can get the best possible response in the rural areas, because at the moment, we're nowhere near seven minutes. It's, it's between nine and 12 minutes, and often um, at the upper level, uh, which is quite a significant difference from the other areas. And I, I have another question too, but I'm not sure it's for you. It's about a rumor I picked up about pathology at Sirencester Hospital. Perhaps we can come to that later. Yeah. OK, on, on the ambulance um, target, I, I can reassure the committee and we can have something back on SWAS at a future meeting that there has been new investment, new vehicles on the ground in Gloucestershire in this year. I realise there is that um, real issue with getting um, performance delivered across the whole of Gloucestershire in each of the areas. But that is a really difficult problem. And we are investing in first responders. That would have been an issue as we work our way through COVID. But that it, it's not it's not something we're taking lightly. We are focusing on that with the Ambulance Trust. And we may have to take another report back to you to talk this through again. It is an issue that's very difficult to tackle. Do you want to come back with your second question, Nigel? I've just picked up, it may be anecdotal, but it was from staff in the hospital, apparently, that the pathology service, blood testing and so on, in science, so what people think is very efficient, um, is being either wound down or removed. Can somebody deny that, please? I can answer that if you like. Um, we, we have been working with our GP practices um, for a number of years on um, ensuring there is an equitable phlebotomy service across the whole of the system. And um, we have um, uh, been asking each area, each primary care network to agree how they would deliver that phlebotomy service. So this practices in Sirencester will be delivering phlebotomy in their own practices on an ongoing basis for that population, as are indeed um, most of the practices across the country. So th that service, in fact, should be more responsive for those people because generally people don't have to wait for bottom in their practice. They can just go and get that service directly. And obviously. And does that mean the res response times, getting the result of a blood test back, will be as good as it was um, when we were using the hospital? The, the, the results will still come back through the hospital. There should be no change to results. 
Okay, thank you. Um, are you happy with that, Nigel? I'll move on to Martin Forward, who's uh, got a question. Thanks. Um, yeah, I've got two. Uh, one, first of all, on the cancer referrals. That's, I mean, I, I'm struggling to find the, uh, the right page of the report right now, but uh, that's obviously very good news if they've returned to 100% of the expected level. But presumably, because it was so low at points during the, the, the height of the um, epidemic, uh, we must have a presumably an, a significant backlog of, of cancer referrals to cope with. Uh, otherwise, unless there has been some mysterious dip in the rate of cancer. Um, so uh, I just wouldn't mind Mary talking about how that's being dealt with either by the trusts here or the or colleagues in primary care. Um, and then the second question is just to um, ask about page 12, uh, where we have the split in the four hour A&E weight between Cheltenham General and Gloucester Royal. Uh, and the Gloucester Royal figures are really alarming. I mean, um, back in March, there were, there were three instances where more than half of um, people coming into Gloucester Royal were waiting more than four hours. I mean, it was down at 50%, nearly down to 40% at one point. And there have been very significantly lower um, achievement of the four hour uh, wait at 60% and, and just over 60% in just in the last, well, in the, in the, in the months of late May and June. Um, I mean, these are really worrying numbers. If that was somebody who had um, a requirement for, I don't know, uh, a, you know, a suicide uh, treatment within four hours, you know, an antidote to paracetamol or something like that. Um, some of these are very, very concerning numbers. Um, and it does just, again, once again, I'm sorry to sound like a broken record at every hosk, reinforce the impression that for reasons of bed capacity or process or whatever, that Gloucester Royal simply cannot cope. Um, and that the centralisation of um, emergency admissions at Gloucester Royal is going to cause us real problems this winter. And we don't want to have the grim satisfaction of saying, we told you so, if there's a real crisis this winter, if there's a second wave, and if there's an increased uh, incidence of flu and so on. But this paints an alarming picture of a system that wasn't really coping at Gloucester, even you know, without the, the, the expected pressures at winter. So so to your to first point. I'll, I'll happy to respond to that, Mary. Um, yeah. So Martin, you, you've chosen to reference um, the onset of the pandemic. So in March, um, our services felt, I have to assure you, much tougher than they felt in any winter. We had large presentations of patients whom we weren't able to confirm in a rapid time frame uh, their COVID-19 status as we, as we can now. Uh, the four hour standard is a measure of when a patient is discharged from the department or admitted to a ward. So again, I can absolutely assure you that doesn't mean that patients were waiting more than four hours to be seen, to be assessed, to be triaged, um, to ensure that they were in, in safe hands. Um, if you look at performance nationally, you'll see that March was a, an extraordinary month. For me, what's most important is to look at performance now uh, after the changes have been made uh, that I've talked about in great detail, so I won't go into them. And you can see that we have got incredibly strong performance at the moment, both relative to our previous performance, but relative to, to national performance. Uh, and I think that's where the focus should be, not on how we perform during the pandemic, when that was about saving lives and keeping people safe. Thank you. Are you happy with that response, Martin? Um, well, not really. <laughs> I mean, actually, uh, you know, I highlighted that some of the very poor performance figures for Gloucester are much more recent than the height of the, the epidemic. And it's the differential between Cheltenham and Gloucester that is so striking. Um, I mean, presumably, uh, you know, Cheltenham logically ought to have been similarly affected. But, you know, it's, um, it's, a, it's a very worrying picture in my view. And this is why we have changed the ratio of activity to workforce. This is what the changes were about. We spoke in here at length, um, Martin, about the service changes are about aligning uh, activity and workforce in the right way. If that means we need uh, more capacity, more workforce, and that's part of the, for the future changes that we're 
we're talking about. We've talked previously about the difference in, in case mix, but I think it's really pertinent to look at the fact that Gloucestershire Royal's performance, both in a pandemic, as activities returning to usual levels, whilst keeping patients safe, um, is very strong and indeed uh, comparable to last year. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I think we made the point and had a, had a response. So we will now move on to the next item. Uh, we've got two items left for information. So the next one is um, the one lost shirt ICS lead report. Um, this is Mary. Mary, do you want to, um, is this is for information, do you want to take it as read and I'll just see if there's any questions or? Do you to yes, just to say briefly, we wanted to share with the committee our response um, structure around managing COVID, first of all, which we've now moved forward into our um, structure, which is managing the restoration and recovery of services. And we've highlighted in the report um, that we have picked out some of the um, areas where we think that people will be impacted on a longer term basis, such as respiratory due to COVID. And we have work in underway to actually understand how to work with, with people with, with outcomes which, which are which are not um, which are due to COVID. We've mentioned vulnerable people. We also um, will pick up some work on volunteering and inequalities as part of this work. So I'm happy to take questions or comments. Right. Uh, I, the only hands up are Nigel and Martin, which I think is from the previous item. Um, so they'll in interject if that's not the case. Um, other than that, I don't think we have questions on that item. So we'll just move on to the last one, which um, is the um, CCG Clinical Chair Accountable Officer Report, again from you, Mary. Um, hello, hello. Brian, Steve Lydon's waving at you. <laughs> OK, uh, I'll come to you, Stephen. Um, i to this thing, otherwise it's going to be... Right, can I talk? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mary, one of the things uh, I've been concerned about is that I've been told that there's a lot of the people that volunteer during COVID on the NHS route rather than going through the local route haven't been utilised. Is it possible to have their details passed back in to the local route? Because there's obviously still a lot to be done. And many of us are thinking and considering what else, how we can best utilise that altruism and work with those volunteers. And I just wondered if there's also going to be an evaluation of why, when all these good people put their names forward, uh, nothing was, nothing was seen to be felt for them to be done. But. Um... Right. Um, Stephen, uh, that, that's a brilliant question and thank you for asking it because I had written a note on volunteering for the report and I didn't quite get in there. So we have now, um, we've now, um, Work together with the council's district voluntary sector, police, etc. And we've we've um, asked the voluntary um, care alliance to work with us. And we've just issued a survey to everyone who volunteered as part of COVID to ask them what their experience of volunteering was, and also they'd like to volunteer with us again. Um, so I'm happy to send that note around to the committee if you're interested, because we'd like people to. Um, to be aware of this and to work with us. And some of those people who volunteer will be offered then opportunities to volunteer in the voluntary sector, as well as with the um, with the public sector in the future. Yeah, thank you, Mary. I think that would be very helpful. Um, so, does that answer your question, Steve? So I don't want to labour it, but that's all what I go, Mary. What about all those good folk that weren't used? Yes, well, they're all part of this exercise, but as, as many people as we can contact, through the Voluntary and Community Care Alliance, we're going to contact them and talk to them about what would they like to do, what are the opportunities, and are they prepared to come forward with us to work with us in the future? And then we have set up um, a structure where people can um, be trained as volunteers. We can put some investment into our volunteers across the whole of the public sector and the voluntary sector to try to make volunteering something new and different for the future. For example, we've been given some money to get people to be trained up to volunteer to support people with diabetes, that sort of thing. We want to think about a different way to use volunteers. And if people want to volunteer, for them to have an easy way to get into volunteering. Thank you, Mary. Um, I don't see any further questions um, being asked, so um, we'll take it there. And the, the last item on the agenda, which we were going to, was the... Uh, Accountable officer report for Mary. Did you want to speak to that, Mary, or should we just take it? I'm, I'm happy to take comments or questions or, on that report. It's from the whole of the system, actually, so other colleagues may want to answer as well. Okay. Uh, I got 
I, I think Steve Lydon put his hand up, but that probably was for the previous item. So nobody else is looking to. So thank you very much, Mary, for that report. Um, uh, that brings us to the end of the... Sorry, agenda. Chair. Yes? yes, I do, actually. <laughs> uh, yes, who's, who's indicating now? It's That's, Martin. Uh, oh, Martin, your, your pipe on. Yes, OK. Come on, Martin. Sorry, uh, muting myself back. Um, I just wanted to pick up on the, the part of the report which is about um, the support to care homes, which I think is excellent. Um, and I, I, it's clear that colleagues in Gloucestershire have done uh, a lot to try and um, support the care sector. And I think things like the, the earlier mention that um, there had been no shortage of PPE uh, in Gloucestershire um, is, is quite a thing to, to be able to say, actually, uh, in the light of the national situation. Um, but I just wondered, just picking up on what Councillor Willingham uh, asked in his public representation, um, and that if it was actually, I mean, I, I was expecting that to be about the nine care homes in his patch in, in the super output area that he identified. But it actually, in the response we were given, it seemed to be two care homes in particular that had um, very bad outbreaks and whether or not that was the contributor. But I just wondered, um, he asked if there were any systemic failures that we saw in the support for care homes, not just uh, locally, where we, as I said, I think we, we seem to have had a good response, but in terms of national support for care homes and whether we have picked any of those up and that we should be feeding those back up to the Department of Health or to uh, ministers. And I just wondered what anybody's uh, response was. This may be Margaret as well as, as Mary, but uh, what people's response yeah. was to that. If I, if I could just start, um, well, there is a lot of national work on care homes now, but in, in 2014 in Gloucestershire, we did start um, a significant amount of work with GPs, etc., supporting care homes. So there are named GPs for each care home. So we were disappointed to see the results for Gloucestershire initially, but we believe we believe that we have identified, as we've understood further, uh, the issues about staff moving between care homes, about training with PPE, and uh, as you say, having good supply of PPE, that we've identified a lot of those issues. So we are feeding all of the learning back into the national work, and there is a huge amount of work on this. But in Gloucestershire, we already had quite strong services in place. But the, but the question really was whether you've locally identified any national or any systemic failings which you attribute to national policy or practice which have affected care homes in, in Gloucestershire? Um, well, one of the um, things nationally they will be rolling out is that um, that um, care home enhanced service support. They're going to roll that out. They've, they've rolled out the need for care homes. That sort of thing has been is now being a national is now being rolled out nationally. We had already started quite a lot of that in Gloucestershire already, although we still have more to learn. You, 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 Martin. Yeah, I, I, I suppose I'm just emphasising I'm not this is, absolutely, this is the reverse of a criticism of local response which seems to have been very impressive and local preparation um, it's more about those learnings that we're feeding back into the national picture and what perhaps if you are feeding those back up to the Department of Health maybe that is something that could be shared with uh, the HOSC in due course yeah okay thank you Okay, well, we'll pick that up. Um, I wasn't sure if Margaret wanted to come back in then or not. Was it, was there... I was just going to say that the two, uh, a couple of examples of things that we learned. One was when um, doing the PPE training, um, the number of care homes that had staff that didn't have good use of, of English language um, and couldn't read English and therefore had not been able to interpret the guidance. So we fed that back to the department on the basis that, you know, they needed to think more creatively about how to give those messages. And you will have seen subsequently, there've been lots of Zoom films and uh, social media instructions um, in either different languages or um, in cartoons and demonstrations, that sort of thing. So that was one of the issues. Um, the other one that we picked up very early on and, and in, intervened was when um, homes had their own view of the use of PPE, as opposed to the clinical um, instructions for it. And so they were either overusing PPE and therefore causing a strain on the supplies. And we were particularly worried about them using gowns when the NHS needed them and care homes don't. Um, 
or that they, you know, we have one example, for instance, of a, a home where one of the um, partners of the member of staff was a builder and he had a particular range of masks and they were all wearing them, but they weren't appropriate. Um, and so we had to intervene then. So I think it was the, the lack of experience of barrier nursing and that type of clinical um, activity that was the most um, obvious cause for us to concern. And we got involved with, you know, literally within days of, 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 um, of the pandemic. Um, and, it, and it goes back to, I think I said, at the social care um, committee, it goes back to the conflict that we've now got to face, which is that for the last years, we've been telling care homes that they are a home, they're not a clinical environment, and that they're to be as, as nice as possible and as kind and friendly and warm and cuddly as possible. But actually, for the last four months, we've been saying, no, you mustn't do any of those things. This needs to be a clinical environment and you need to behave in a different way. And what we have found is some providers have found that very difficult, as indeed have the residents. Hey, Margaret. Um, right, I've got two more uh, pe uh, members of the committee asking questions now, so I'm going to go first to Dylan and then to Helen. Oh, no, sorry, I put my hand down afterwards. It's just a brief comment because uh, I have an experience of being on a patient panel. I'm a patient at Oxford, actually, because of where I live. Um, and just to say how very helpful it has been to be part of that. Um, I'm a shielded patient and it. it um, it's been uh, it's been really wonderful to get direct advice on what you can do and what you can't do. They've uh, developed a sort of traffic lights like system to um, as as if uh, we're being told as we're sure the patients we can gradually come out of lockdown and having that that sort of system set up has been tremendously useful. So I'm just commending the the uh, setting up of patient groups to discuss their experience. Thank you. Uh, right, uh, we'll go to. Um... Uh, Helen Molyneux, who's got a question. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, mine is a rather more practical question, I think. Uh, while this has been going on, I've every three or four weeks run around all the Forest of Dean care homes to find out how they're getting on. To start with, it was to do with PPE. And I, when I, several told me that they were very short. I reported to the leader of our district council. He got on to Gloucestershire and I was delighted to be told that within a day for one and a couple of days for others, they were supplied with everything they needed. Since then, all that has gone very well. Uh, and when I ring the care homes, I'm always impressed by the care and consideration with which they treat their residents. However, one point, my mother had dementia and I know that if somebody had advanced towards her trying to swab her nose or her throat, it would have been like World War III. She would not have understood what was going on. She would not have been able to cooperate. She would not have been able to, to be tested. Now I've asked the care homes how they manage this. Some to say they've got one member of staff who's very good with the patients who manages to do it. Some say it's very difficult and takes them a long time. One care home told me that they feel that if the resident does not have capacity to consent, they're very worried about what they're doing. Now, my question then to them is, how would a change help you? And the answer from all of them is, if we could have a saliva test, which would be very easy to administer, that would be a great help. Now, are there any plans for that to go ahead? Because I'm sure that would be a great help and a great benefit. And the poor patients didn't need to be frightened to death. Thank you very much. So I think the answer is, at this point, that's not available, but it's a good idea. Thank you, Mary. That's obviously something to take away as, a, as, as something that may come in the future. Uh, I've got one other person, I think, indicating that's Stephen Hurst. Uh, so we'll take his question now. Stephen? Thank you, Chair. 
I think one disadvantage of dealing with care homes is that each care home is an organisation on its own. And that makes it more difficult to deal with when you're looking at a set of set circumstances. So maybe there is an opportunity for some more horrible word regulation in care homes, which offers a pattern of operating standards. And by doing this, you can we can start to attempt to have an overall mandatory model of care. We've just got the opposite at the moment. Thank you. Yeah. I think we've got agreement there from Mary yeah. on that. I think that's something that is being considered nationally. People are just looking at how to do this better, but you've got to balance this with, with the need to be at home in your care home. Okay, thank you. I think uh, I think that covers all of the questions off. Um, so it's for me really to um, thank uh, you as a committee for attending and being um, asking some challenging and interesting questions uh, to the officers um, who uh, I'm, I think we're losing one or two having to get, go off to other meetings um, to uh, for giving us time and, and giving us quite a lot of information um, quite a lot of food for thought and clearly the next meeting is going to be an important one so um, I will say thank you all for coming along oh uh, Becky if you want to come in I'm so sorry I didn't want to interrupt you Brian That's and okay. um, I, I can't seem to find the hands um, symbol. I just wanted, before we leave Mary's report, um, I just want to draw attention to the really important survey that we've got going at the moment, um, where we're trying to collect people's experience of COVID, um, having used any, any particular health or care services. The link is in your papers. Please, can you encourage everybody you know to take a look at that survey and provide us some feedback? It doesn't close until the end of the month, but um, but while I had a captive audience, I really wanted to promote that. I hope that's okay. Sorry to interrupt at the end. Yeah, okay, well, thank you very much. And we've all received that. I've also got a point raised from um, Martin, um, who wants to raise a, a question on track and trace. So that's not really an agenda item, Martin. But I know, but that, that's the difficulty. We haven't really had a moment to, <laughs> to just ask. It's just two quick things um, for Sarah. Um, one was that she, she mentioned in her sort of opening remarks right at the beginning of the meeting, um, that the local public health team didn't have access to PHE's outbreak management notes, I think you said, uh, which sounds like a, an alarming bit of unjoined upness <laughs> in the system. And I just wanted if, wondered if, she, if I heard that right and if she could just sort of uh, explain that. Um, and then the other one was just about the capacity in the local testing sites, like um, I think it's Brockworth, isn't it, the closest one to Cheltenham, where anecdotally we hear of people, of only a handful of people turning up to be tested some days um, with sort of staff waiting around for hours on end uh, with no one to test, which again just seems as if something in the system isn't quite working. Presumably we could volunteer more people for, for testing if, um, if that was the case. Okay, thanks, Martin. So, so um, your you did hear me correctly. So PHE have a case management system called HP Zone that I do not have access to. So I am not allowed access to that. Um, it is something we're working through with PHE. I have a dedicated contact in PHE to, to sense check information, but I do not have live patient identifiable information about cases. The, the flow of information to direct to the public health is getting better. So I think uh, living in actually, our relationship with the South West Public Health England Centre is excellent. And I think there's been a lot of learning that's come out of the outbreak in Leicestershire in terms of how relations between local authority directors of public health and public health can be improved. And I would I do nothing but praise my colleagues in the South West Centre because they said they are excellent. But I understand it's a national issue in terms of them not being able to share the case management system. Um, having said that, I do get a range of other sources of data, but it's not always as timely as access to the system that they use. The second issue about testing, I think it's helpful um, to, uh, perhaps I could share my um, adult and social care scrutiny report from last week. Um, Margaret also had an 
um, a section there about care homes, and perhaps the Commission will find that helpful as background, even though we don't have pressure services. But there are two main routes to testing nationally. One is called Pillar 1, which is fundamentally NHS testing, and Brockworth has a drive-through site, which is primarily for the um, NHS testing that needs to happen, staff or patients. Public access their testing is something called Pillar 2, and Pillar 2 testing is operated by uh, private companies rather than the NHS, and the main site is at Meadows in Gloucester. And you book on to get a test by going through the national portal on the gov.uk website or the NHS website. Um, and there are a whole series of criteria. So you can't just you mainly people that have symptoms. So we, you're absolutely right. We do have lots of spare capacity uh, in our Pillar 2 site. Um, I think some of that is down to the fact that we have very low numbers of COVID circulating at the moment. So in the last seven days, we've had eight confirmed cases. So that's something to be thankful for. But we do have a large amount of unused capacity. And um, when I was chair of the SCG for the local resilience forum, I volunteered as to be part of a pilot with Department of Health and Social Care to understand how we might better use that excess capacity. And I've got another meeting this afternoon to understand that. But I think it's important to note that there's a national testing strategy and we must work within that, uh, which we are doing. Um, but also we need to test the science behind COVID. We learn more about COVID. COVID every day. So I, I've suggested that because we have a low prevalence, we probably have some capacity in our system to better use those swabs. That's what we're doing at the moment. We also have, under the Pillar 2, mobile testing centres, uh, units that travel around the counties. They've been to Cinderford, um, I think we have one in Borton, um, Stowe, um, and they travel around the county to, because we recognise we're a large rural county and it's quite difficult for people to access tests. You can also request a pillar two test online to be sent to your home if you can't drive. But you're absolutely correct. We've got an underutilisation of swabs. I think one of our MPs, Richard Graham, raised this in Parliament, um, I think last week. Um, but I think the, the view was that it's good to have underutilisation of tests because at least you've got enough testing capacity. And, and when we do see a surge, at least I'm grateful to have that flexibility in our system. Thank you for that. I think we've covered off um, the agenda and uh, the extra questions. Um, so um, I will say again, thank you all for attending and taking part. Yeah. And I look forward to seeing you all in September. Thank yeah, you. Thank, thank you, you everybody. Uh, Margaret, Pam Tracy, uh, can I, I speak to you later? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah go, yes, go on, Pam. Left to unmute. <laughs> All right, Margaret. Yeah. I've lost 